we're going to continue the Gamma Days with the sessions and the different presentation. Uh, thanks again uh, for the previous round table. It was really, really interesting. Uh, and now we're going to talk, we're going to continue to follow a presentation about transportation and mobility. And we're going to start with the first presentation from Frank Thailandier about uh, uh, an ABM to support collective reflection on the evolution of mobility. Okay, so you can see your screen. You just have to unmute yourself and you can go in it and walk. See your screen. You can just make it, make it uh, full screen, maybe. So is it okay for you? I don't know if I am presentator mode or not. Yeah, it is. Everything's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, hello everyone. So I'm Frank Taillandier. I'm not Patrick. So, <laughs> but I'm also from INRA, but Aix en Provence. Um, and today we'll uh, present um, the Switch project, which is uh, founded by the French National Research Agency. Uh, it involves many researchers, as you can see on the left. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of them. And this project, uh, or a part of this project, um, is to uh, design an ABM to support collective reflection on the evolution of mobility. So, as you know, mobility is a major issue for all cities. And one question, one question is, what do we urban mobility be in the futures? Um, I have not the answers, but I can make some proposition. Maybe it uh, will be like uh, lots of uh, active modalities, people walking, uh, biking, etc. Maybe it will be with uh, autonomous cars, or maybe, I don't know, with flying cars. I'm not sure of this, but uh, why not? Or maybe a combination of all of this. But there are some evolutions in progress uh, as active mobility, uh, smart infrastructures, etc. All of these evolutions have uh, both positive and negative aspects, as uh, for the positive, uh, the decrease in noise uh, or the reduction of pollution, but uh, also negative aspects as uh, new vulnerabilities or new pollution. So the idea of the project is to anticipate the uh, evolution, to take advantage of them for urban mobility. Because we know that the choice that the city makes in terms of mobility, notably uh, regarding urban planning and infrastructures, have and will have a very important impact on the life of the inhabitants. So the objective of the SWITCH project is to propose a tool for the different stakeholders of urban mobility, such as urban planning agency, politician, but also inhabitants, and citizens to think about what mobility will be in the future uh, and help them to imagine the way to get there. Uh, the tool uh, aim to be prospective and not predictive. Uh, it's uh, impossible to uh, guess what uh, will be the future of mobility, uh, but we can imagine uh, this future or these futures. So <clears throat> how we can do uh, this? Uh, firstly, we plan to design an ABM of urban mobility with two, uh, two components, a traffic model and a modality choice model. Secondly, in order to ensure the collective thinking, uh, we also design a mobility assessment model and the scenario generator. Finally, we will use participatory simulation tool to ensure uh, the reflection thinking of different people. So I will present very uh, rapidly some of these elements. Firstly, the traffic model. <clears throat> so um, it, uh, it will be a multimodal traffic model. So it has to, to consider not only the current modalities as cars, public transport, or um, don't know, walking, but also the modalities of tomorrow as, uh, I don't know, teleportation maybe or flying cars or autonomous vehicles. Um, the model will be at urban area scale in order to be able to catch the daily traffic. 
and uh, it has to be easily instantiable and generic uh, to be uh, used to any city. Uh, we use a GIS data for this. And uh, so in order to be able to simulate a variety of scenarios and at the same time at urban area, we use um, multi-level uh, dynamics for the model at micro, meso, and macro levels. Uh, you will have just uh, after this presentation, I think uh, another presentation indicated to this model. So we'll have more details on it. The second part of the ABM is a modality choice model. So model to simulate the choice of modality by the inhabitants. It will be based on the Ben BDI architecture. I think uh, we, there are some presentation on Ben uh, and that um, He has to consider the multimodality, so the capacity of people to use different type of modalities to, to make one travel. He considers also, it considers also variety of criteria as economics or environmental or social criteria to, uh, for the choice of the modalities. And also uh, a very important point for the, for the choice of modalities, the strength of habit. Um, and uh, also it will consider the rational, but also not so rational choice uh, of people because we want to simulate human and human are not so rational. Finally, um, we want also to be able to um, uh, simulate the specificities of each individual. Uh, we'll use synthetic population and synthetic agenda. Uh, there will be parametric because we want to be able to simulate some evolution of the population of, of the agenda. For instance, if we want to have a scenario with um, teleworking. And the two components of the model, uh, the traffic model and the modality choice model will be strongly connected because traffic depends on modality, modality choice and modality choice depends on the traffic. So there are a strong connection between these two parts. And uh, we want to also, the model has to uh, be able to not only simulate the current situation, but also the evolution in the future. So what kind of evolution and how to simulate them? Um, just an example, uh, we want to uh, make people imagine different possible scenario as uh, this one. And we, thanks to the ABM, we'll be able to simulate the current situation and to give to people some indicators. Then um, we can simulate the advance of time, the price of time uh, with this scenario. For instance, we have the current situation. Another situation, intermediate situation here, um, in with, uh, with the autonomous vehicle are autorized. But at the beginning, only few people can be able to use this type of vehicles. And maybe a third situation in which uh, people, a lot of people can use this type of vehicles. So it's three pictures, three snapshots of the evolution um, of the situation, and at each time we have indicators. We have also in the model participatory elements, uh, I, at least there's three elements, uh, three times for participation. Firstly, to build the possible evolution. Uh, we want to, uh, we uh, already performed some interviews and we want to make some workshop uh, to, with people, with a variety of people, to uh, make them imagine uh, what will be the future of mobility. Uh, we will use also participation to select and validate the indicators. For now, we have uh, 63 indicators uh, from a literature review, but maybe we'll use only a part of them. And finally, uh, using the ABM, uh, we plan to uh, design a serious game on mobility choice to promote soft modalities. And secondly, a participatory simulation tool to test different strategy and evolution with uh, different stakeholders. We want to test, uh, to use this tool with a group of stakeholders with uh, different uh, type of stakeholders as a citizen, politician, etc. We have for this project two uh, partner cities, Bordeaux and Dijon. 
uh, we use the S2 city as a case study and for the participatory uh, elements. And to finish the results, uh, we have no result today because it's just the beginning of the project. Maybe next year, uh, uh, we can just say that uh, the, the way to the result is long yeah. um, because the project is ambitious, but I'm sure we are on the good way. If you want to keep informed on the project, we have a website and a YouTube channel, and uh, we'll uh, update uh, this to, to support uh, along the progress, the project. So thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for, for the presentation. Uh, I let you share the, the links on the Slack. Maybe it will be easier for people to, uh, to copy paste them, to use them. And well, it's been, it's been a bit fast from what I have on the program, but I think matter. it's 10 minutes. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I saw that it was supposed to be 20 minutes. No, no, so maybe 10 we're minutes. Gonna be able to, maybe we're going to uh, be able I think, to. Ah, uh, uh, okay. I, I think it was only. Uh, no, 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 sorry, it's, it's, sorry, ten, sorry. it's 10 minutes. 10 minutes. No, yeah, yeah. No, it's Alice. So, so it's just, a just I think I'm in time. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so you were perfectly fine. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Franck. Uh, so now we're gonna continue on the next presentation, which is gonna last 20 minutes, uh, this one, uh, which is from uh, Ali Jacquier, who's gonna present uh, her work from uh, her PhD thesis that she's currently doing, and which is also related to the Switch uh, project. Uh, hi, can uh, you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, maybe okay, can you turn on the your webcam and yes, sorry. use the full screen for the for the presentation? Um, yes. Uh, here we go. Okay, everything's perfect. If my computer wants. <laughs> but you can you can start just try to put it in full screen so it can be easier for people to read yeah uh, i don't know wait can't you are you seeing my presentation full screen yeah yeah you have you have a, a button on the top right presenter probably that it can work with that oh No, it doesn't want to go. Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So uh, I'll let you uh, make your presentation. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alice Jackie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Grenoble. I'm going to present to you uh, the work that we've been doing with Carole Adam, uh, who is a professor at the University of Grenoble. Um, which is called uh, agent-based modeling of habits in urban mobility. Uh, so uh, as uh, Arthur said, it's, um, it's a work that has been done within the switch project, and which is uh, funded by the French National Agency of Research. And my slides are not working. I'm sorry, everything is broken because of me. I ask you to put it, to put it in full screen. My internet connection is unstable. Okay. Um, Don't you have them on your computer or something? Uh, no, because I don't have the PowerPoint on my computer. I can't. Maybe I have version. Yes, but uh, it's a. Uh, we can. It's a bit broken because of the picture. We but can I... switch on uh, Jean-Francois's presentation. So it's going to give you time to prepare everything. No, it's OK. I, I have it now. I, can, I just need to change my okay. settings of screen sharing. Mm -hmm. OK, here we go. But some pictures are going to be uh, on the side. I'm sorry. 
Uh, okay, again. sorry for that. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a, a bit about the context of the switch project. So we are currently facing an environmental crisis and urban transportation is among other uh, a reason behind pollution. We also know that mobility is constantly evolving. As you have said in uh, 2011, the average distance traveled every day got multiplied by nine in eight years from five kilometers to 45 kilometers per day. And we can also witness the evolution with the, um, the, with the electric scooter and uh, the VTC, for instance. Um, so knowing those two uh, things, we have a need to adapt our mobility behavior uh, to evolve towards a more sustainable um, mobility. And this is in this context that uh, the switch project uh, is born. So to create a tool uh, to explore uh, mobility scenarios and uh, to help um, urban planners to make decisions. So um, I'm working on the human um, model and the decision uh, of the mode of transportation. Uh, and in order to make a realistic simulator, we need to understand what are the factors that affect mobility behavior. So for that, we propose um, a model for, of the process of decision-making regarding your mobility, uh, mixing uh, rational decision and habits uh, and using a multi-agent approach uh, which allows us to understand the individual agent's behavior and also to highlight some behavior uh, that we cannot do when we have um, a macro simulation. Uh, the second question that we have is uh, how to impact humans on the long term. Uh, indeed, we can wonder uh, this uh, for uh, simulate the behaviors like in uh, our model, but also uh, for the future work for the serious game that uh, Frank just before me talked about. Uh, that uh, so the serious game that will be based on uh, this simulator. So first, I'm going to present the model. Then uh, I'm going to talk about the implementation of it. Then I'm going to talk about experiments and results. And finally, the conclusion and the future works. So the model, um, the environment uh, will contain all the variables that do not depend on the agents. So the gas price, the weather, the road networks, the buildings. And the agents are going to represent the users uh, of different uh, means of transportation. They have several attributes age, gender, social professional category, place of work, place of residency, a level of fitness, and personal preferences. I'm sorry, the uh, sentence is uh, cut. And so how all of this works, we have uh, in the input on the decision model, we have agent characteristics, we have uh, environment uh, attributes and characteristic. Uh, these two things are the input on the, the model, and then the output is a grade for each mode of transportation uh, for each agent, and then the agent can uh, know which uh, mode of transportation is his favorite, so he can uh, use, use it, and uh, this uh, also impacts the environment, uh, since uh, in the environment and also the um, congestion of the traffic, for instance, so if, the, if there's a lot of agents using the car, there will be a lot of agents on the roads, so there will be traffic, etc. So how uh, the decision process works. Uh, there's an agent, he wonders, I have to go somewhere. Uh, and then he says, do I already have an habit for this context? There's two cases. Uh, if he doesn't, then he will do a rational evalu evaluation of the options. So he will, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this rational uh, decision. And this will create a new habit. Uh, and he will go uh, later he will have a new habit, so we go on the, the other side of the organigram. He will use his uh, habitual mode, and then uh, the habits become stronger. Uh, and uh, he goes on, every time he has to go somewhere, he will uh, go through these uh, questions. So the habits model. So we know that habits are created when an action is performed multiple times in a stable context. This is... Uh, um, research on the psychology and sociology. So what we decide to do is to create for each agent a habit table. 
and this table will be use an association of a context uh, and a plan and also an integer to represent the number of occurrence of this plan, which will uh, represent the, the strength of the habits. So every time an agent use, uh, the, um, uses a habitual mode, here I say habits become stronger. So this is the number of occurrence. And for the context, so it's the state of the environment. So for now, it's uh, the weather, the starting location, and the destination. But it might uh, change uh, for the, the next iteration of the prototype. And we also know that habits are easier to modify when there is a change in the life cycle. So this is a, an article from Brett and Al in uh, 2014. So for this, in our model, it's uh, kind of complicated to, to to model the changes for now and we wanted to keep it simple. So we decided to have a, a proportion of agents every day that will reset their habits table. And that will be this kind of um, example of change in life cycle that can be uh, movings, uh, a new baby in the family, a new job, uh, for instance, etc. We know that uh, there's uh, several kinds of intervention for these habits. Um, Fair Planken and Wood in, uh, in 2006 uh, presented two kinds of uh, interventions, the upstream uh, inter interventions, uh, which are the interventions that will focus on changing social norms. And because the social norms are uh, causing the target's behavior. And there's a down downstream uh, interventions that will focus on changing directly the target's behavior. So for instance, uh, communication campaign, uh, et cetera. And there are two kinds of actors as well, uh, individual. So for instance, if we take the example of the I don't know, stopping of cigarettes, you can decide yourself to stop, to stop smoking. You can decide to learn about the uh, effects of cigarettes, et cetera. And there's collective and for collective, it will be the state, for instance, that, de that decides to put uh, the law, for instance, law, uh, the Evan law uh, in 91 that uh, forbids to smoke inside. So in the model, uh, we um, uh, uh, coded some uh, interventions. We um, can, the user can modify the subscription for public transport price, the gas price, the bus capacity, the cycle waste ratio of a word, roads, and the proportion of agents dropping their habits every day. So the, it was the proportion I was talking earlier. So how does the rational decision model works? Uh, so the agent, uh, as I said earlier, is going to give a grade for each uh, agent. And uh, so we decided to take into account uh, four uh, mean uh, of transportation for now, which is the car, the bike, the bicycle, the public transport and uh, the walk. Then uh, from the literature, so from psychology and sociology studies, we extracted uh, six criteria, which are comfort, time, price, ecology, simplicity, and security. For the, and for each criteria, each agent will have a value for each mode of transportation. I'm gonna explain this uh, later more in detail. Uh, it's this value is here to compare kilometers and time, for instance, or comfort uh, thing and ecology thing that uh, uh, raw data are, are not comparable. And for each agent, they will uh, give more or less importance to each of these criteria, and we're gonna call it its preferences. So, for instance, if an agent, it's for an agent, it's very important to be comfortable during the the route, then. Uh, for comfort, you will say it's eight. And if he has all the time in the world, you will say time is not important for, for me, it's just two. And, and so on for all the criteria. And the grade is basically a, a mean, an average between all the value uh, weighted by the um, preferences of the agent. So it's just, uh, just a, uh, an average. So the normalized value that I talked about um, so here is a recap of all the variables that uh, intervene in the computation of the value for each criteria and means of transportation. So for instance, uh, if we take the gas price, uh, the, sorry, the price for the car, it will depend on the gas price and on the distance. 
So uh, the value on itself for the press is a value compared to the other prices uh, of the other uh, means of transportation. For instance, uh, like I mean, the, the lowest price is going to be one, and then it will go uh, lower and lower um, for the more expensive it gets. And for the car price, we just calculate the distance that the agent has to travel and we multiply it uh, by, uh, by the gas price. And we use the mean of uh, consumption of the, um, of the gas in uh, 2019. So for the grade, we're gonna do one example, for instance, for the bicycle uh, on just three criteria, so it's not that long. So let's just take an agent that has uh, five for comfort, eight for price, 10 for ecology. And we suppose that the weather is nice, the distance is three kilometers and the agent is not athletic. So here you can see for the price and ecology, it's, uh, it's a value that is uh, fixed uh, because the price is, uh, free for the bike and for the ecology, it's very ecological. And for the comfort, it will depend on the distance, the sportiness and the weather. So we're gonna do just a, a mean of these three value. So since the distance is three kilometers, it's going to be uh, quite high because it's just three kilometers. It's easy to do with on a bike. Uh, the agent is not athletic, so it will be zero. And since the weather is nice, maybe it's uh, like a, a bit windy or something, it's gonna be 0.9, we divide it by three and we obtain uh, 0.57, I think, from memory, but it's not very important. And that's how we get, uh, so this is 0.57, it's just uh, the, the value for the comfort for the bike. And then we do the mean uh, weighted by the preferences of the agents. So five, eight, and 10. So there's supposed to be a 10 here and it's, uh, 0 0.98 uh, for the bike with just this three criteria. So for the implementation, uh, so it's been implemented on the Gamma. Um, and for the environment, uh, we integrated the map of castanet Lozon, uh, which is a city near Toulouse, uh, with the GIS of, uh, from uh, OpenStreetMap uh, with buildings and roads networks. For the agents, we simulated the thousand agents and they all live and work within the city. And for now, the agents are just going uh, to and from work every day. Um, but later we're going to have a more uh, sophisticated uh, agenda. So here you can see a, a tiny video of the, um, of the agents moving towards the city. You can say it's the first day, it's uh, eight in the morning and the blue agents are the agents that are staying at home. The, and the different colors here are the different uh, means of transportation. And you can uh, see them moving. So uh, for the experiment, what have we done? So we um, want to run two simulations. Uh, the first one uh, is to change the proportion. Uh, we want to, to run the simulation and uh, at some point change the proportion of cycle wave from zero to one. So there's no cycle cycleway in the streets, and there's a, all the streets are have cycleways. And we do this with 90% of the population that resets their habit stable. So it's almost like there's no habits. And then we change, we want to do the same thing, but this time with 10% of the population that reset their habit stable. So a lot of people have their habits, and then we can compare the impact of the habits uh, model. On the on our whole model with the rational decision. So uh, the first results. Uh, so here in uh, purple it's the walk. In light green it's the bus. In red it's the bike, and in green it's the car. The legend is here, but maybe it's a bit small. So here we can see that the intervention has indeed <laughs> increased the number of cyclists uh, in our model. But um, we can see that uh, between each point, it's 12, 12 hours. So we can see that uh, an increase of uh, that much cyclist in 12 hours is a bit unrealistic. Uh, but so these, these are the results. And then if we do the same thing with the, the B, so first we can see that the curves are way more stable. If we go back here, we can see that there's a lot of ups and downs. Here it's way more stable. 
And so we did the intervention here at the beginning of the, of the slope. And uh, we can see that for the same augmentation uh, increase, increase, we have uh, a, way, a lot of more time between those two um, things, which is a bit more realistic. And we can see that the, the bus and the car has been really stable and almost like uh, uh, not um, impacted by the, the intervention of changing the, the ratio cycle weight. Okay, so to conclude, uh, so we offered a model that allows agents to not recompute at every step their mode of transportation and that creates habits. Uh, it's also useful because the computation of the, of the grade is a, a bit heavy for the computers. So it's also um, good for that. Uh, and they have a, a habit stable and with the creation of context, etc. Our first experiments showed us that uh, an augmentation of the cycleways ratio over roads leads to an increase of, for cyclers, cyclists as well. And uh, with the habits, the, the increase is way smoother than without habits. For the future works, uh, we want to improve the realism first. So with the agents, um, we want to uh, add the synthetic uh, agendas and population. And for the environment, we want to, uh, for now, the agendas are just going to work and to, from home and for population, it's uh, randomly generated. And for the environment, we can add uh, the weather model, for instance, the public transportation network, because for now it's just uh, temporal uh, information. Like we know the bus capacity and the frequency of buses, but we don't know where the, the bus stop are. And it can be a, a huge uh, reason for a choice of the bus or not the bus. And also an integration of the digital elevation model because for cyclists, for instance, it's, uh, it might be very important because uh, one kilometer, if it's just a, a slope uh, going up, it might be way harder than if it's uh, flat. For the serious game, uh, so as I said in the beginning, we want to create a serious game uh, in order to involve citizens in the development uh, of the future's mobility first, but also for them to understand their own behavior in, in, ter in terms of mobility and to highlight some uh, mobility behavior and to maybe, uh, so they can think about taking the soft uh, means of transportation. And also uh, we want for the model to develop new kinds of interventions like uh, free bus tickets or pedestrian zones, etc. Thanks a lot for listening to me. If you have any question, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you very much, Alice, uh, so for the questions. Uh, as always, we're going to gather them and ask them at the end of the session. And so now we're going to go for the next presentation, which is going to be done by Jean-François Erdely, uh, still on the Switch project, uh, still in France, still uh, in the South. And he's going to talk and present us uh, a gamma tools uh, for modeling for multi-level traffic simulation. Yes, thank you. We uh, can see your, your screen. Can you just put it in full screen? Perfect. You, it's okay. You, you can speak. Okay. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jean-François Erdely. Uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, first year PhD student uh, in the SMAC team in the ERIT laboratory. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, some gamma tool for multi-level traffic simulation. And um, this presentation will split into three parts. The first of all, the context of this work, description of the model, and the description of the gamma plugin implementations. So the context, this work is a part of the INR project named SWITCH for simulating the transition of transport infrastructures toward the smart and sustainable cities. The main uh, goal of this project is to study the impact uh, of politic decision in terms of mobility and traffic at different scale. For example, uh, if I do something uh, in some place, uh, what's happened in 10 years, or if I do something in a neighbor, little neighbor, what's happened in a whole city, something like this. There is two sub purposes, help the decision making for urban planners and participatory simulation and sales games. So uh, my toy model is like this. This is a 10 kilometers uh, highway, as you can see, split into one kilometer section. Uh, this section is here. There is a main entry on the left, the main exits on the right, and there is two alternative exits. 
And the color that you can see here uh, correspond to the kind of uh, model used. Blue is for the micro model uh, section and green is for meso model section. So there is two kinds of modelization of vehicle. Uh, and here in this case, we, are, we have 100% of micro model, here 40% and here 0%. So first of all, the micro model is IDM. Uh, um, this model is uh, relatively interesting because uh, with only six value, you can have this kind of behavior as you can see here, the compression and decompression. Uh, when I will just switch to green up, you can see the decompression behavior like this. And in this case, the vehicle are active and road section are passive and vehicle computes the speed depending off interaction between the other vehicles. So it's very interesting for to, if you want to do some micro modelization, micro, uh, micro roads, uh, micro model roads. And uh, the second one is a meso model uh, event based. So as you can see, uh, the this section is meso section. There's a car uh, with uh, light blue here, stop. And after uh, some time, the car reappear here. So in this case, the vehicle are passive and watch section are active. And watch section compute the time to travel depending of its capacity, depending also of the, the length of the road, of course. And also the outflow time. If you know the, the max outflow of the section, you can compute the outflow between two vehicles, the max outflow between two vehicles. And this is uh, that it's used here in order to, to, um, to to have a good outflow um, outflow simulator. So uh, the experiments, we have some parameters that we want to, to explore. This is the inflow, five value. We, uh, the two, this values is um, the max outflow of the road. And there is 11 value of uh, road hybridization from zero to 100% with an increment of 10%. And there is 20 simulation per couple of parameters and 80% of the car vehicle are going from the main entry to the main exits. So 20% in the two alternative exits. And in order to, because the, the, the main purpose of this model is explore what is the, the, the impact of hybridization in terms of quality versus uh, speed of computation time. We have some indicators to do that. We have the vehicle main speed, vehicle travel time, computation time, and the density. <clears throat> uh, we observe uh, uh, with some value of inflow, both models have a good balance. So we can have uh, um, the meso model is more um, uh, quick, fine, most of uh, the, the computation speed of uh, time is, is better, but the behavior is relatively the same for, for all, free, all vehicle. The micro model, full micro model is uh, good for uh, the variety of observed behavior, but the competition time is really bad compared to the meso model. But you have some good balance between these two uh, things uh, with uh, about 60% of uh, hybridization. And you can also um, play with the competition time versus the, the variety of observed behavior, depending on what you want to know about the system or something like this. The idea is uh, uh, today the, this uh, model uh, is not able to switch the, the representation during the simulation dynamically. Uh, it's, uh, it's static, so you, you planify the, the, the strategy and the coupling strategy, and it's the same for wall simulation. So we would like to explore the dynamic coupling strategy in order to change during the simulation, for example, because the, the user want to know something in the system and a certain uh, road, something like this, or maybe because the computation time is too, uh, is too slow. So we would like to, to switch to the uh, faster model, something like this, or maybe because we have two uh, macro model, meso model, whatever, but uh, the, one, the first one is better for one kind of uh, thing and the other one is better for another thing. So you can, we would like to switch between them in order to, to know something different of the system. And of course, we would like to apply this to the real application uh, of the city of Dijon and Bordeaux. 
Uh, this is two, uh, two city uh, of the enfin, using the switch project. Okay, now I will to explain my implementation. So uh, I implement uh, IDM has a skill, as you can see. Um, IDM extend moving skills. So you have everything from the moving skill, every attribute and action. So you can, you have the speed, you have the, the actual path, etc. But also the attribute from IDM that I present before. And uh, I, I redefine the go to action in order to have um, a new facet named uh, follow in order to know who is the next vehicle and compute the delta speed, compute uh, the behavior depending of the, the vehicle uh, in front of the, the current vehicle. Um, and also, well, yes. And also for the meso model, um, we need to have uh, an event manager in order to, uh, because the, the meso model is event based. So uh, I uh, create uh, in red here a control, in, in yellow here is a skill. So we have two kinds of agent that we can instantiate in Gamma. The first one is the event manager agent here, and the second one is an event-based agent. The event-based agents use the skill scheduling in order to do something later, the action later. And uh, he, <clears throat> the event-based agent uh, must have uh, an event manager in order to register an event. An event. And uh, the, this events use the control event manager. <laughs> and um, you can specify when you uh, you can specify the action, the time, the, the date, and you can also specify the parameters of the action, of course. And uh, you can also uh, set uh, a special parameters name uh, referred to. For example, in my implementation, when the 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 section want to wake up uh, a vehicle. He want to wake up the vehicle with refer to the next section. Uh, it's not really clear, but I, I can do something, uh, call in action and refer to another uh, agent when the, the, the vehicle is, uh, is awake. And to finish the implementation, I implement two new type in Gamma, the queue and stack. Uh, you can use push and pop st statement like this in order to manipulate it. Uh, is not uh, a modifiable container, is a classic container. So you can't modify the value, for example, like a list, or number three, do something. You have to manipulate it with the push and pop statement. Um, and this is it for me. And uh, if you have some question, I can answer. This is a little video of an implementation in the little neighbor in Castanet of them. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. So for the questions uh, at the end, once again. Uh, so now we're going to switch on the last presentation of this session. And we finally going to leave France and the switch project uh, to go in Vietnam with uh, Duke Pham, who's going to present us a plugin about traffic in, in Gamma applied in, in Vietnam. Um, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, so I, I, let you I have a small you. technical problem, so I need a few seconds to uh, rejoin Zoom. Is that okay? Okay, well, we have to <laughs> wait Sorry. for you. Sorry for that. Um, so, just to wait, uh, Jean Francois, because you're still there with your, your camera, I just had a quick question about the new types that you developed the stack ones uh, did you implement them directly in gamma or is that a plugin that you're developing uh, everything that i present is uh, in the plugin so you can instantiate like uh, like a list or something like this it's not uh, um, an agent in gamma if this is the question Okay, perfect. It was just a question. Uh, Duke started the share screen. Uh, Duke, if you... Okay, so we see a screen, we see a slide. Uh, you can just uh, turn sorry. on your camera. Yes, so, uh, just, can see you. just a second. I'm yeah. struggling with Zoom, okay. sorry. Can you see everything the slider? Yeah, 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 everything works. 
uh, and the camera. Can you see me? Perfect. Everything is perfect. Right. So you have okay. 10 minutes now to present, to make your presentation. OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dirk. And uh, for the last few months, I've been working to improve the traffic plugin in Gamma. And so today, I'm excited to share with you some new updates on the plugin. Uh, here's the outline of my presentation. Uh, a quick introduction on the traffic plugin. Uh, this plugin has been around in Gamma for quite a long time now, uh, and uh, it allows users to easily create a traffic simulation in Gamma. And uh, the plugin provides uh, three new skills, uh, advanced driving, a skill road, and skill road node. And uh, I think their names are pretty self-explanatory. So I will jump straight into the new features now. Uh, the first one is the ability to uh, specify different vehicle width. Uh, and this is particularly useful uh, for certain countries uh, where people use different types of vehicles. Uh, Vietnam being the prime example, because uh, uh, people in Vietnam uh, mainly use motorbikes in addition to cars and buses. Um, there are two new attributes uh, related to this feature. Uh, the first one is num lanes occupied, and as, as its name implies, uh, we can use this to specify the vehicle width in terms of the number of lanes. Uh, the second one is lowest lane, uh, which is the occupied lane with the smallest index. And uh, by using these two attributes, we can easily locate uh, where the vehicle is. Like for example, uh, if we take a look at this green vehicle on the right side, it has lowest lane equals to one, and uh, it is two lanes wide. So um, it is occupying lane one and lane two using this range. Uh, very simple. Uh, the second new improvement uh, is related to how vehicle moves. Uh, so in the uh, previous version of the driving skill, uh, there was some limitation. Uh, firstly, the acceleration is uh, always a constant value and it is always uh, equal to the value uh, set in the max acceleration attribute. Uh, secondly, uh, the braking deceleration is not simulated at all, uh, which means that uh, vehicles will stop abruptly when uh, they approach a red traffic light or when they approach uh, another stopping vehicle. Uh, and the third problem is a minor one. Uh, there's this confusion between uh, the two attributes, speed and real speed. And I didn't really understand them until I took a look at the underlying code. Uh, so to overcome these drawbacks, uh, we decided to incorporate the Intelligent Driver Model, or IDM, uh, to the driving skill, uh, which you have seen from the previous presentation. So uh, it, is basically, it is a car following model. Uh, i.e. the uh, state of a vehicle de will depend on the leading vehicle. Uh, the model takes three inputs, uh, the speed of the current vehicle, the current vehicle, C stands for current, uh, the speed of the leading vehicle, and the distance between the current vehicle and the leading vehicle. Uh, the output of the model is the acceleration of the current vehicle. Uh, here's the uh, equation for the uh, IDM. Uh, but instead of diving uh, into the details, I will just quickly uh, uh, summarize what this equation does. So uh, as you can see, uh, this equation can be broken down to two parts, uh, a free road term and a braking term. Uh, the first part is the free road term, uh, which represents the acceleration of a vehicle when there are no uh, obstacle ahead. Uh, this term is maxed out when uh, the speed V is small, but uh, it gradually goes to zero uh, as V approaches the max speed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the braking term represents the uh, braking deceleration, and uh, this term will, will increase when, one, uh, the distance to the leading vehicle decrease because uh, you should slow down as you approach uh, the vehicle ahead. Uh, two, uh, when the uh, speed increases, because um, 
if you go too fast, then you should probably slow down. And finally, when the speed difference delta V is positive and is increasing. So uh, you should also sl slow down when uh, you are going way faster than the uh, leading vehicle. And uh, once we have the new acceleration value from the IDM, we can proceed to updating the position and uh, the speed of the vehicle uh, using this formula, which you might recognize from high school. Uh, one, dif one minor difference is that in a speed computation, uh, we also take into account the uh, speed limit of the road as indicated by the alpha multiplied by V limit here. Um, so to summarize, uh, the IDAM has the six has six parameters in total, and uh, uh, they have uh, corresponding attributes in uh, GML. Some are familiar, but uh, some are new. Uh, another area of improvement is uh, related to lane changing. So in the previous version, uh, a driver would always choose the lane where they can travel the furthest. Uh, but uh, we have decided to switch to a new lane changing model, which is called Mobile. And uh, uh, in this model, a driver will switch to another lane if, uh, firstly, uh, it is safe for the new follower or the new follower, the follower is just a closest vehicle behind. Uh, this uh, criteria is a new one. And uh, the second condition is uh, that the new lane must be more attractive. Uh, this one is similar to the previous version, uh, but it is still a little bit different. Uh, and these two correspond conditions correspond to two criterions defined by the mobile model. So we will, first we have the safety criterion, and uh, this basically says that uh, the deceleration of the new follower n uh, must not exceed a cer certain threshold be safe, uh, because uh, this value is the deceleration, so it's a negative value, and that explains the uh, greater than sign and the minus sign. Uh, and then we have the second criterion, which is the incentive criterion. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the first part is the acceleration gain of the uh, of the currently lane-changing vehicle. And uh, this can be thought of as a reward. Uh, while in contrast, uh, the second term is the uh, resulting deceleration of the new follower N uh, caused by the lane change of C. So because this is a disadvantage to vehicle N, we can talk of this as a, as a penalty. And uh, this penalty term is also weighted by a politeness factor P. And so if the sum of these two reward and penalty is greater than a given threshold, a thresh, then uh, we would consider the new lane to be attractive enough for changing. Um, there's one more thing that uh, in certain countries, like in many countries like Vietnam, uh, one should keep to the right side of the road uh, while driving. And uh, this can be simply uh, uh, to reflect uh, this behavior. Uh, we can simply introduce uh, an, a bias term on the left hand side of the inequality. So uh, basically, we will uh, reward the vehicle if uh, it decides to uh, change to the right side lane uh, or punish the vehicle when it uh, changes to the left side lane. And this can be reversed uh, in the case of uh, left side driving, like in the uh, United Kingdom, for example. And so to summarize mobile, uh, we have uh, four parameters in total, and uh, there are also corresponding uh, attributes in GML. And now we move to the final new feature, uh, which is the ability of vehicles to allow one-way roads. Uh, this feature is, is inspired by the side driving skill uh, implemented in the escape project. And uh, this uh, feature can be used for simulating pedestrians because pedestrians can move on both way in the same road. Or it can simply be used for rough vehicles. 
And uh, to use to enable this uh, behavior, you can toggle the new attribute, uh, ignore one way. Uh, however, there's still some current limitations to the new version. Uh, the first one is that the simul simulation time step must be small, and this is due to some implement implementation details, uh, which we are hope to fix soon. Um, and the uh, other one is that uh, the new version has not been uh, tested enough because I'm the only user so far. So if you are working on a traffic simulation, uh, I would be really happy if you can give uh, the new version a try as soon as I get it merged into the master branch, I mean the new branch of Gamma, the, the 1.8.2. So to conclude my presentation, uh, the new version of the driving skill comes with three improvements, uh, variable vehicle width, uh, more realistic movement of vehicles, and the ability to violate uh, one-way roads. Uh, some future works will include uh, comparing the simulation outputs to real data, and uh, this gives us a chance to uh, perform model collaboration in order to better understand the different parameters provided by the, the new um, traffic models. And uh, we can also, uh, we are open to implement more traffics and lane change models. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Duke. I, well, uh, as all the other uh, presentation, very interesting. Uh, so now we're gonna switch on the question. So I see that uh, people have been discussing a lot, uh, mostly about the first questions from Liu, who asked uh, Frank if the switch project, uh, if there were any plan to add some air pollution air quality in the switch project uh maybe Frank, you want to yes uh, i can also say something this question yeah. Yeah. yeah uh yes we want to uh, consider the air pollution because it's one of the indicator uh but now we don't know exactly uh, how but uh if you have some suggestion so there are a lot of suggestions uh, into uh, the slide but uh, it's good for us so thank you very much um, Alice, there has been a lot of questions for you also. So the, the first question was from Patrick Thailandier to ask you, do you consider the type of activity in the choice of mobility? And when, and he gave his personal uh, experience, which is when I go shopping at the supermarket, I take my car even if it's not far. We, especially Chi and Arno, had worked on close model and he gave you some references for you. Uh, yeah, I've seen the question. So the answer is for no. In what in the work that I've presented, it's just uh, the 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 way to the the job to the work and then go back to home. It's just one activity. So there's no um, there's not there's nothing that will uh, force uh, means of transportation or another. But in the specific agendas that are coming in the future. We thought about that question and we thought about, for instance, the groceries. Uh, a lot of people will take the car to carry the groceries. And if you want to go to drop the kids at the school before going to, the, to work, then we have to have uh, passenger seats, which is more complicated in the bike and, and uh, things like that. So I don't know if I answered correctly the question, but it's not done yet, but it will be. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, I do personally had a question also, but I'm afraid it's a bit too early in your PhD research, but about the, the serious game that you plan to, to do. And it was about the, the support of, um, <clears throat> of the usage of your serious game. Uh, because there is a lot of, uh, there is an increased development about how to use agent based model and trying to get some new interfaces. So I'm thinking about the usage of the CityScope table, which had an interactive, like tangible table, projecting the, the simulation on top. Uh, did you have any idea about how to use the, the serious game or just 
keeping the software aspect and just on, in front of the screen? Uh, we haven't decided anything yet. Uh, we we thought more about the um, the main uh, objective of the game, etc. But for all these technical aspects, uh, especially on the um, on the support, uh, we don't know yet. I I personal, personally, I like when it's uh, also a bit tangible, but it might be more complicated to, to do. So it depends also on the game and how it works. But for now, we don't know yet. OK, thank you very much. Um, Jean-François, you also had some questions. So the first one is from Patrick, once again, uh, who's asking, what is the advantage for you to code this in a Java extension instead of YAML one? Are you thinking of adding lane switching? Uh, I already answered uh, this question in the chat, but I can uh, see uh, if you want. Yeah, I can. if you work. Uh, the, the idea is to have um, most uh, as possible uh, model on the shelf in order to reuse uh, it uh, easily and uh, combine uh, it, etc. So, and for the, um, the lane changing, I would like to implement mobile and see if it's possible to combine with uh, IDM, maybe with two different so scale, or maybe one with some option, I don't know, for, for the for moment. OK, OK. And I see that they also have a question from Sri Rama asking the, the difference from the classical gamma, gamma list and mm -hmm. the stack and queue that you added. I don't know if you answer it. Maybe just in a few words, once again, can you answer that question? Yeah, the, the, the queue and stack are FIFO and LIFO, and this is well defined in the computer science fields. And this is object that you can just put something and pop something, and uh, uh, you you can't modify uh, something uh, inside. So it's really interesting when you want to manipulate something uh, really clearly. And uh, but in my case, because it's something from in uh, using the the IPI of uh, Gamma, you can cast Q and stack in list if if it's needed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, finally, Duke, we have questions for you. So the first question comes from Sri Rama, um, who said that the num lane occupied seems uh, unintuitive and maybe will it be oh crap. maybe will it be better to have it as a zero to one scale and also the lane width are standard almost all over the world so a vehicle occupying two lanes seems odd maybe can you tell us more about the idea behind that okay so uh the reason that we cannot uh use the vehicle width measure in meters or something like that directly is because uh, uh, the previous uh, lane change model is discrete and I'm working uh, on top of that. So um, it is uh, easy for me to uh, extend it uh, using uh, the concept of num lanes occupied. Uh, and um, uh, the way that I intend to uh, use uh, this uh, attribute is that, um, for example, in Vietnam, we have motorbikes and uh, cars. So um, uh, I can say that uh, the car is uh, double the width of a motorbike. So I can uh, set the num lanes occupy of a car to two and uh, the num lane occupy of a motorbike to one. So um, basically, you should uh, uh, set num lanes occupied equals to one. Uh, for the most narrow vehicle. Uh, that's the uh, main idea. Maybe it's not perfect. But... No, but it's a decision. I think it answers the question. Uh, there is another question for you, Duke, from Alexi, who asks, do you plan on adding physical realities, like weight on vehicle, collision, and their consequences? Yeah, I haven't thought of that, but uh, that can be one uh, interesting uh, idea to implement. Okay, and I did have uh, a small question, which is that adding the virtual lane and everything seems to complicate to 
make the road network more complex and more heavy on the computer side. And do you know if there is any performance impact of your driving skill on, uh, on the model? Uh, I haven't uh, tried running it uh, with uh, thousands or ten thousands of vehicles, but uh, with the uh, provided example model in uh, the driving skill, uh, it has not shown any uh, performance degradation. But I will perform more rigorous uh, performance tests in the future, in the near future. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you for your presentations and for answering the questions. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or in the Slack channel. And now I propose you to take a 10 minute break and after it's going to be Benoit, which is going to present and mod uh, moderate the next session about the new Gamma feature. Thanks, everyone, and see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We are about to start again. Mathieu, are you here? I will check if you're here. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. And uh, Louise. Okay, I can yeah. see you. Patrick should not be very far, and Kevin too. Okay, fill on time. So uh, this session, session number 12, will be the second session about, uh, let's say, new feature of gamma, improvement of gamma, with a huge focus on, um, let's say, cognitive architecture of agent, with the three first presentation, and the famous uh, GenStar paper by Kevin Chappie. So the first presentation will be given by uh, Mathieu Bourget about using uh, Ben for the simulation of cognitive, affective, and social agents. Thank you, Benoit, oh, sharing my screen. Perfect. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, as Benoit said, my name is Mathieu Bourget, and today I will speak about the Ben architecture, which is an architecture that gives cognitive, affective, and social dimensions to agents. And this architecture is implemented in Gamma. That's why I'm speaking about it uh, today. So the context of this uh, work, of this architecture, uh, is the social simulation. And one of the biggest problems of the social simulation, one of the biggest questions is how to simulate the behavior of real people, and especially in complex situations. But how do we simulate the behavior of real people? Uh, a first way to do it is uh, by following the KISS principle and say, OK, let's keep it simple, stupid. Let's use simple rules. Uh, people are following simple rules. We're going to use simple rules to simulate them. But we can also say, no, real people do not use uh, simple rules. Real people use psychology, sociology, and a lot of stuff to make decisions. So maybe we can um, follow the Eros principle that say, OK, let's use the social and psychological work to model and simulate the human uh, behavior. That's, why we, that's what we followed. Um, and in our work, how do we do it? Um, the objective is to create an expressive and believable behavior uh, usable by the majority of researchers for social simulation. That's why we did it in um, Gamma. That's to say, OK, everyone can use it. But the objective is to have an expressive and believable behavior. To do this, um, we worked on four axes. First, formalization of all the dimensions, the cognitive, the affective, and the social dimensions. I will not go in detail about the, the formalization. You can find it in other papers. I do not have time to do, to do this right here. Uh, second axis, integration of all these dimensions that are formalized in one behavioral uh, architecture. Then making this architecture as generic as possible. This is important to understand that this architecture was not built for a use case. Uh, I will show you a use case at the end, but we built the architecture and then we found the use case, but it can be used in a lot of um, situ different situations. And finally, so the architecture has been implemented using the principles of Gamma, so uh, it, it is usable uh, in Gamma. Let's go uh, right deep uh, right now um, in the Ben architecture. Here it is. So this architecture is uh, composed of uh, one main block, which is on top of the um, agent personality. I will explain the personality later. And in the main block, you have four modules, numbered one, two, three, and four which are around the knowledge basis of the agent. These, ba these bases will be influenced, will be changed by the, the different module. That's why it's uh, in the middle. Um, what you can see on this figure is that you have some dotted lines and some plain lines. Plain lines are a mandatory part of the architecture. You have to use this um, when you're using the Ben architecture. These mandatory parts are the cognitive basis and the, the making decision module. If you do not use this, you do, you do not have to use BEM. 
then it's used for so, so the, the agent can make a decision. So you have to use the module making a decision. The other module, the other process in each module, as you can see, are in dotted lines. So they are optional. You can choose to use it or choose to not use it. And then the processes are either blue or uh, pink, reddish. The blue one are automatically and completely, completely automatically computed by the computer. The pink one are manually modifiable by the, the user. The, the modeler can parameterize the, this stuff. Uh, let's go in details on how this works. So you have first the knowledge basis um, in the middle, cognitive basis. Um, ben is based on the BDI model. So you will find beliefs, desire, and intentions. But we'll also find um, some uncertainties, obligations, and ideals. These are the cognitive bases. Uh, in Ben, an agent can have emotions. That's why the emotional base is in dotted line. If you don't want to use emotion, the agent will not have emotions. Uh, so emotions, social relations, that's the social bases, and norms about in the environment, uh, that's the normative base. And um, the, the, all the architecture, as shown here, is on top of the agent personality. The agent personality is based on the ocean model the big five factor model, openness, consciousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neurotism. What it means is that uh, an agent has a value on each of these factor between zero and one, representing its personality. And then these uh, values are used to compute the vast majority of the parameters of all the processes um, of the architecture. For the detail, um, uh, just see other um, other article previously written. Um, if I go back to the module, first module, the perception. The perception module updates the knowledge of the agent depending on its environment. It enables the agent to change its mind, to change its behavior depending on its uh, on its environment. It has four processes. Um, creating beliefs where the agent can create new beliefs or new uncertainties, uh, manage emotional contagion, create new social relations depending on its perception. If it perceives another agent uh, with whom he can create a new social relation and apply sanctions to enforce other agents' norm. Once the agent has perceived its environment, uh, it can manage its own knowledge. That is to say, okay, I know what's new in the world. So now what does it change to what I had in mind? Uh, so for this, the modeler can define inference rules that say, okay, I have this new belief. So this, this means I have to remove this old um, desire, for example, or I have this new uncertainty. This means I have this new desire, stuff like this. On the same model, you have laws to define some obligations. Depending on the perception, you have new obligations. Um, and then you can have an emotional engine and social engine, which are completely automatic. They are in blue. So you don't have to, to know how it works. Just, OK, if I use it, if I plug it on, my agent will have some emotions based on uh, the OCC model. And uh, the social relations of my agent will be updated automatically. Uh, once again, I do not go into details. If you have questions about this, um, we can discuss this uh, later. OK, so the agent has perceived its environment. It has managed its own knowledge. So now the agent can make a decision. The agent can make a decision either with a normative engine or with a normative engine and a cognitive engine. Uh, to do this, this is based on BDI. An agent has a current intention. And when it, an agent has a current intention, it needs to choose a plan. How do I execute uh, my intention? I want to do this. How do I do this? Um, to understand it better, uh, first, the agent uh, think, OK, do I keep my current intention or not? Do, do I keep continue what I'm doing? Uh, for example, for myself, do I keep continue doing this presentation or do I have another intention? I will continue the presentation. Don't worry. Um, then do I keep this, the same plan? Do, am I doing what I'm doing the same way? Yes, no. If this is a yes, okay, I execute. If there is a no, 
I have to find a new intention and to find a new way to answer this intention. If you use the normative engine, the intention will be from an obligation. If you use the cognitive engine, the, engine, the intention will be from a desire. When you have your current intention, you either choose a plan or a norm, depending on if you're using the cognitive engine or the normative engine, and then you execute the plan on the norm. Last module, the knowledge dynamic. So the agent updates its own state um, by degrading the mental state. So each mental cognitive state as a lifetime, which means an agent can forget about its beliefs, about its desire. Um, each emotion has an intensity and a decay value. So at each step, the intensity is reduced by the decay value. And at the moment, if the emotion has an intensity of zero, the, the agent does not have this emotion anymore. Uh, finally, the status of each norm is updated. So when another agent will perceive me, uh, he can apply the sanction or not um, easier. So um, just an, over, an overall view of how it works. At the beginning of a step, one agent one says, okay, I do my perception. If the perception is defined, if you do, do not want to define perceptions because you do not want your agent to react to the world, you can. It's not mandatory, it's optional. Uh, so executing the perception, executing the full process of the perception, then executing the managing knowledge, the making decision, the knowledge dynamic, uh, end of the step for this agent, another agent uh, take, the, take the hand on the computation. And at the, the next step, once again, perception, managing knowledge, and so on. To understand it better, uh, as I said, we, we build the, the, the architecture. Uh, it's a theoretical architecture. We implemented it in Gamma. And we said, okay, let's use it on a use case. The use case of the Kiss Nightclub incident. Uh, the Kiss Nightclub is a nightclub in Brazil. It took fire. There were 242 people who died. Most of them, because of the smoke, found around the restroom. What happened that night uh, is that there were between 1,200 and 1,400 people in the club. So the club was overcrowded. Plus, uh, all the anti-fire systems were off or broken down. Uh, no alarm, only one exit door. Um, uh, and the only sign alighted were pointing to the restroom, which are at the north here and at the south uh, east of the blueprint. Uh, the idea is, okay, how can we reproduce what happened uh, that night? And can we reproduce the behavior of the people inside the club with Ben? To do this, we have to identify what, behave, what is the behavior, what happened, and what are the dimensions connected to this. So the first step is, okay, if I see a fire and I know where is the exit door, I run to the exit door. That's simple, that's simple cognition. You have some perception of your environment. You have beliefs about the fire, beliefs about the exit door. You run straight forward to the exit door. But what happened when you don't see the fire? when you on, the only thing you see is some smoke. And the idea here is to say, okay, if I see some smoke, I have the uncertainty there is a fire. I'm not sure there is a fire. I know there is some smoke. I don't know there is a fire. Maybe there is a fire. And this maybe there is a fire and I have the desire there is no fire. It creates some fear. I'm afraid there is a fire. And if this fear intensity is above a certain threshold, depending on the person, uh, I will run to the exit. This is an emotion. I have, I'm afraid there is a fire. So we are using emotions to model this. Then there is emotional contagion. If I see a lot of people running and I just see them running, I don't care. If I see them running and looking scared, I will be okay. I'll be, I'll be scanned myself and I follow them. I don't know what's happening, but maybe I have to follow them. So emotional contagion. On the same um, model, uh, social relations, I can help friends, social norms. If I don't know where to go, I follow the other people. And obligations. If I don't know what to do, I have to follow the official rules and the official rule says, follow the signs. And in that case, the signs were pointing to the rest. So uh, we model all of this. 
and we obtain this statistical results. Um, so the first table show, is showing the number of deaths uh, we obtain for um, either 1,200 agents, 1,300 agents, 1,400 agents. Uh, as a reminder, there were 242 people who died um, in reality. So this shows, okay, the model, uh, what we built is close, statistically close to what happened. And uh, the second table uh, is just the um, computation time. So for the simulation of one second, it, it takes around uh, 800 milliseconds. So it's uh, completely running live. What's more interesting, uh, I will show you a small video um, because, okay, we are statistically close to uh, what happened, but is the model expressive and is the model believable? Expressive, what you are seeing uh, right now, uh, the, the green triangles are people who saw the fire, they know where is the exit door, so they just run away um, to the exit. Uh, in the corridors, some other people will have emotional contagion and will follow them, not knowing there is a fire, but okay, I see people who are afraid, I'm afraid myself, uh, I leave this, uh, this space. And the other uh, white triangles you see here are people who don't know what's happening. They are just continuing to dance because they have no idea uh, there is a fire, there, is, there are some smoke and stuff like this. And if I go on, so the smoke spreads and you will see a lot of different color, colors. Uh, so this is the expressivity. Uh, that is to say, agents can tell and we can tell, okay, what are you doing and why are you doing this? And an agent can say, okay, I am following this plan. I am doing this action. Like, okay, I'm following the signs because uh, I don't see anything, I'm afraid, and so on and so on. So we are using psychological terms to explain things. So it's expressive. And uh, the believability, uh, well, what we can see, we can explain it in simple terms and understand it. Like people who are not afraid, who don't know what's happening, right there in the right uh, side corners, in the right side of the plan, they, they don't know. So they don't move. They have no reason to run um, anywhere. Okay. So this was the first uh, case. And um, we had another case, another nightclub, uh, which got on fire. Uh, the case is uh, similar, but not quite the same because the place was not overcrowded and there was an alarm. But we assume the people are behaving the same ways. Uh, there are no uh, really way to think, okay, they're, they're behaving different. So let's take the people we, we model in uh, Brazil and let's put them in this uh, American uh, nightclub where there were uh, 100 people who died. And in our simulations, we obtained close to 100 people. Uh, I can show you once again the video, but uh, well, we, we, do, we do not have uh, time. Uh, once again, we, we, we can see uh, what's happening. We can understand what is happening. So uh, the expressivity and the believability goals uh, are, uh, are, uh, are okay, are attained. To conclude, Ben has already been used by others than me. Um, and it's all, it has been already been used uh, partially. That is to say the, the first uh, work uh, from Truong, it's only using the cognitive part. The project Swift is only using the cognition and emotion, if I remember well. The Libin project is using cognition and social relations. And there is another study on the station uh, nightclub, uh, which is using cognition, emotion, and social relation, if I remember well. You have the links uh, to the models, the, the two models um, I show you, and uh, you will also find the videos if you want to, to see. And you have the link to the tutorial if you want to try Ben uh, by yourself. That's all for me. Thank you very much. And uh, if I'm right, uh, Ben is provided uh, with all the Gamma platform version. I think, yeah, yeah. Mm. right now. And with, uh, with example, so it can be used uh, in Gamma Vanilla, no, no extension needed. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.
for everybody don't hesitate to ask questions on, on the chat. Uh, we'll uh, gather them for the discussion session after the presentation. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Louise Braz, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. We uh, will present an extension on uh, the same architecture, pen architecture, uh, to model uh, B, uh, MBTI agents. Hello. Sorry, Louise, I cannot hear you. Can, can you see my screen? I see your screen and now I can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. Thank you for your time. My name is Luis Bras, and this work, Extending Ban Architecture for Modeling MBTI Agents, I've done with my advisor, Professor PhD Jaime Sishiman. Well, it, it's hard to talk after this great presentation from Mathieu, but I hope you enjoy this talk as well. So let's start. Well, first of all, uh, what is BAN? We have seen uh, with the last presentation um, about BAN architecture. BAN behavior with emotions and norms. It's an agent architecture very useful to provide uh, to the agents some capabilities such as social um, um, and social relation, cognition, emotions. And a special one that I'd like to explore in this work, personalities. Um, this is the whole Ben's architecture we have seen in the last presentation in details, um, a lot of capabilities. But in this work, I'd like to explore uh, this part of Ben architecture uh, the use of ocean personality and other uh, personality models. Uh, so uh, uh, the ocean model is basically uh, one of the most famous behavior model we have. It's not used only in a multi-agent system context. Uh, it's used, for example, for many companies globally uh, that, that want to, for example, to better understand employees' behavior or for many other use cases. So it's a, it's a, very, a very famous behavior model. Uh, there are five dimensions we can measure with this, we can use with this instrument, O, C, E, A, N. And with these dimensions, we are able to, uh, to understand some personalities, styles from the individuals. With ocean model, uh, we are able to, uh, we, we have a range of values from zero to one. And, and for each dimension, we, we will have a value that represent the personality style from an individual. So for example, if you are a shy person, uh, you will have a, a value for, for E dimension very close to zero. Uh, on the other hand, if you are uh, an extroverted person, you will have a value um, close to one um, for the same dimension. So uh, it's a good instrument to, to be able to, to understand the different um, behavior style, styles for the individuals. It's very useful for modeling agents with this instrument. And uh, well, with Gamma platform, we are able to use ocean model as well as the whole band's architecture, uh, just adding a simple BDI uh, package. So it's very simple to use. We just need to add simple BDI in our agent, and we are able to use um, all band's capabilities we are able, um, for example, in this case, uh, to define uh, agents' personalities. 
And so very, very simple to use. And however, ocean model is not the, the unique existing behavior model. We have many other behaviors model. And in this work, I've tried to explore the use of MBTI, that is another behavior model. Uh, this instrument was developed by Isabel Myers and Catherine Briggs, and it's based, it's based on Jungian psychology. So with this instrument, we are able to explore some other aspects of behaviors in the individuals, and it would be important to be able to use um, some other behavior models depending on the situation you need. So for example, with this instrument, uh, we have the, the dichotomies with MBTI. Uh, so we are able to understand the behavior styles of individuals using some others perspectives uh, with dichotomies. Uh, each dichotomy measures some aspects of behaviors and so uh, the purpose is to try to use Ben architecture, but instead of using an ocean model, be able to use, for example, MBTI in our case. So uh, in our model, we use the whole Ben architecture. For example, there are many useful functions, uh, for example, perception functions, uh, the whole BDI architecture that is implemented within BAM. Uh, so we can use, for example, plans, we can define desires, intentions for, for our agents. So uh, it's very useful to, to use all the BAM's architecture. Uh, but that, as, I as I mentioned before, Instead of using ocean model, we've decided to use MBTI because in our model it would be it would fit uh, properly, and uh, so we we've developed some custom models to be able to plug in in the band architecture. So, for example, uh, in this uh, when we defined the plan of our agent. And over here, we developed a custom model uh, to calculate MBTI personalities. So within this calculate score, we are able to calculate MBTI instead of using an ocean. Uh, here, uh, we have some details of this function. Uh, of course, because of the time, I'm not able to, uh, to go deeper in each of these custom models, but uh, the message is it's possible to use the whole band's architecture and uh, just plug in some custom models, for example, representing uh, the personalities, the, the personality model you would like to use. In our case, MBTI, but could be any other model. Uh, so as future improvement, uh, it would be good to have a, a BANS native integration with MBTI or um, other personalities, uh, personality models, because um, maybe in some situations, uh, it would be preferred to use um, other behaviors model. So, that's it. I, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. If you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the presentation, very clear. Um, we will gather all the questions for the discussion session at the end of, of the presentation. So th thank you very much. Thank you. So the next speaker will be, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, Patrick Taillandier who will basically introduce a new uh, like artificial intelligence toolbox for gamma with argumentation based on network machine learning.
So I will try to share my screen. Uh, so it's not really a toolbox, it's more because I, so for now, for many years now, I developed uh, some plugins and I just wanted to present three of them that I think can be useful for, for some of you. And maybe you don't know about them. So it was, uh, the idea was to present some, some of these uh, plugins. So I choose three plugins for, for this presentation. Uh, so the argumentation framework, Bayesian network, and machine learning plugin. So, uh, so it's three plugins that are dedicated, that can help uh, model to define uh, the behavior of agents. And uh, so you know that uh, Gamma provide already several tools to define the agent behavior. Like I think most of you are using reflexes. Maybe some of you are using final state machine. I'm not sure that some of you are using rules, but you can use rules in, as well in, uh, in Gamma. Uh, so you can use a Ben architecture, uh, or you can uh, define, uh, try to define behavior using the system of differential equations, and many other ways of defining uh, behavior in Gamma. Uh, but uh, there are also some plugins uh, that I work on for several years that can be useful uh, if you want to define the behavior of your agents, and then can be combined with the other architecture. So uh, I will speak today about uh, so argumentation, so that allow, to argument, allow agents to form an opinion based on arguments and to exchange them. So it was already used by Loic, but so during this presentation about the division innovation, it was using, he was using these uh, plugins. I'm going to speak uh, very quickly about uh, the Bayesian network plugin that I developed in a few hours. So be a few few minutes of presentation, and the last one it's about uh, so it's a wake up plugins. It's about uh, to give uh, to allow the agent to have uh, learning capabilities. Now, of course, uh, if you have a Rails version of Gamma, uh, you can directly download them and integrate them in your Gamma version. Uh, you just you just have to go to the so you menu and install new plugins. Then in the work with uh, you can choose the experimental website. And you will see that it has uh, there are many plugins that can be useful. So here yeah, you have the argumentation, Bayesian network, and wake up plugins. So let's start with the first uh, plugins. So I will not tell much about it because uh, Louis already presented many things. In the, I mean, uh, the most important things about it. But so as I said, so I want to argue uh, with each other and to build an opinion from arguments. So it's based on the formalization of those of arguments. So it means that um, so in these plugins, each agent will have so a, a, a set of arguments. So the first thing that I did is to define a new type uh, that is the type arguments that is added. Uh, with, uh, so it was already uh, described by Loic. So you have an ID. Uh, the option so is what is uh, uh, what is the, the, the idea what is uh, defending uh, these arguments so a statement a rational the conclusion of the arguments the criteria that is that is concerned by these arguments the actor that that just uh, bring these arguments and the, the type of source of the arguments and so uh, I already had a I'll add, in addition, a new skill that's called argumenting. So I use it here. So that provide agents with this argumentation graph. So in argumentation graph, you have arguments that, represent, uh, that are nodes of the graph. And we have uh, an expert representation of attacks between uh, arguments that are the edges of the graph. So in this case, it means that these arguments will try to invalidate uh, this one. Uh, this one will try to invalidate this one and so on. So uh, each edges is uh, evaluated according to the preferences of the agent that is based on uh, uh, different uh, things, in particular, the, how we evaluate the importance of the different criteria that are linked to the arguments. Uh, the, the, the confidence that he has a different source type uh, that is uh, defines the arguments and so on. And from that, so the, the agent is able to uh, build an opinion from it. So you have for that one uh, action that is called uh, make decision that allows an agent uh, from this type of graph to uh, to to make a decision to, to to build an opinion from it. 
and so to use it is quite easy. You just have to use the make decision action. So like this, it's a low learn agent to, to, to be his opinion. And after with this structure, it's quite simple to, uh, like uh, it was uh, done by uh, Loic, to uh, implement some exchange of, arg of arguments between agents that can change their opinion uh, on different things. So uh, it's all for this first plugin. Now we'll speak about the, the, the Bayesian network that has nothing at all with the previous one. But, uh, uh, and that's all an agent reason from a Bayesian network. So a Bayesian network, it's a probability graphical model with, uh, in which you have a set of uh, variables and their conditional uh, dependency. So you have uh, here the different uh, variables and the linked dependency uh, between the different uh, variables. So it, it, it's a way to explain that uh, the value of this one it depends on the value of this one and this one and this one can depend on the value of this one. So. So uh, in Gamma, with these new plugins, uh, you can uh, you have a new type that is a Bayesian network, and uh, we you can uh, like this uh, define so add nodes to add so, oh, sorry add variables to this uh, graph and then uh, uh, add probability attached to this and after to make reasoning from it. So I will not de describe it here, but uh, it's quite straightforward to use it to to, to build uh, the Bayesian network. And after uh, you can use it to make decision. Uh, here in this case, so I imagine I have the dispersion network. If the agent has no that, oh, sorry, uh, that is very angry, so anger is high, then there are many prey and myself, then it will compute the probability to go to end. So using this uh, Bayesian network. So it was a thing that is just developed in a few hours for an application, but uh, I mean, can be useful. Uh, the documentation is not very perfect, but uh, can be improved if necessary. So it's all for this Bayesian network. Oh, sorry. And now we'll speak about the last uh, plugin that I wanted to, to speak about. Uh, it's a Weka plugin. Uh, so uh, Weka, for see if you don't know about Weka. It is an open source uh, toolkit to, uh, that provides many machine learning algorithms uh, for the domain task. Uh, in particular, it provides a lot of supervised and unsupervised uh, learning algorithms. So uh, I will just speak about these two types of algorithms and how they are integrated inside GEMA. So if you add your uh, this plugin inside Gamma, you will be able to use a new uh, way, a new type of data that's classifier, and that allow to uh, use uh, to build a classifier. So to use a, yeah, supervised learning. So supervised learning is that if you have a set of label data. So here, for instance, I have a, a set of data where I have uh, hexagons, square, and triangle that are described by other attributes. I, I know that uh, this is a rectangle, that is a, an hexagon, this is a square. Then I will use it to uh, learn a new models, new, and that will be able to predict. Now, if I show to the model this shape, it will be able to say, ah, oh, this shape, uh, according to this uh, characteristic, it is a square. This one is it? It's a triangle, so it's able to have to classify correctly after the different uh, instance that are permitted to, to to it. And so in gamma, uh, if you want to use uh, this type of classifier, you just have to uh, to have data. So here you can be, for instance, I have a three uh, type of agent with a different shape: circle, square, triangles. I just build a data set with, uh, I use as attribute to describe them, the area and parameter. Then uh, I describe their, uh, if the type of data, what, what is it? Is, uh, if it's a, a square or a rectangle or a triangle and so on. Then I use it to train, to build the predictive model. And then I can use it directly in my model. So I can just say, okay, my, to my model, I want to classify this new instance that is described by this array in this parameter, and it will be able to uh, classify correctly this new instance. 
And uh, so in Gamma, with the weak plugins, you have access to many algorithms. So uh, to build decision tree, uh, to build a set of rules, to build to build uh, uh, neural networks or SVN or uh, random forest and so on. But you can use it as well to you for regression algorithms. So to learn not not to classify, but to learn a function. So you have several algorithms for that. And to finish, uh, it's so in Gamma you already have uh, some uh, algorithm for uh, clustering, uh, but uh, with these extensions you have uh, some new algorithm. So uh, X means, K means, uh, expectation maximization, uh, DB scan, and some other. Uh, so the presentation one to need to go faster. So uh, to conclude, so it was a very short presentation just to show that there is uh, there are some plugins that can be useful sometimes, uh, and that add extra functionality to the fan agent behavior. Um, so just the three plugins that has been defined for specific application like the argumentation or as prototype in just few hours, like the Weka one or the one based for the Bayesian network. Of course, uh, if you have some needs. If you want to use use them, but you need uh, uh, if you want to add new functionality inside, it's possible to. For me, I can work a bit on it to, to improve them and to document them. So just uh, to do not hesitate to test them if you are interested. So it's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, just to mention, there is also an additional plugin in the same frame that is about fuzzy logic that came from a query from a user, but I'm not sure that he used uh, sometimes, but it exists. And it was also implemented in a few hours, so very reliable. So the next presentation will be and the last one would be about the GenStar library. So basically an attempt of the, let's say, gamma community in a very broad sense to uh, take the issue of the, um, the generation of synthetic population. Mr. Chapuis. Yep. Uh, so, so Kevin, we, are, we can see you. Uh, I don't know. We, we don't see the full screen. We have this, the part with the notes or with the slides. Yeah, perfect. And now the mic on. Now you are mute now. Okay. Nope. Perfect, the floor is yours. No, your, your mic, you switch off again. Kevin, we cannot hear you. Yeah, uh, the, the host uh, unmet, unmuted or muted me, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so you were not able to see my, uh, you will not be able to see my uh, pointer there. No, you don't see it. I Do don't you? think so. Okay, doesn't matter anyway. Um, so yeah, I will be uh, talking about synthetic population generation in gamma. So uh, there will be two parts to the presentation. The first one will be about uh, a presentation about synthetic population generation in general. And then a uh, dangerous part where I will be showing Gamma live uh, in order to build a population. So uh, let's go into it if it wants to go. Yeah, so what is a synthetic population? A synthetic population is a set of uh, entities, let's call them E, uh, who are representative of a given population P. So P is composed of uh, P individual, you have one uh, on the left of the screen, and the synthetic population should be uh, like uh, the, the, the reference population P. Uh, so it can represent, in most cases, it will represent uh, people, uh, but it can represent anything else. And, and Romain uh, uh, have had a presentation on its work uh, yesterday, on his work yesterday, 
about uh, creating a field crop uh, using uh, GenStar and synthetic population principle. So uh, by representative, I mean that your synthetic population, or I mean the difference between the synthetic population and the targeted population should be uh, close to zero, or at least uh, the lower, lowest as possible. Then what is E in this uh, population? So he is an entity and basically it's a vector of characteristic. Uh, and by characteristic, I mean a value for one attribute. So value V for an attribute A. So for example, there we have this yellow uh, entity. Uh, for the first attribute, uh, we know the color is yellow. And then we have another attribute for which the value is 12. I don't know uh, which attribute it is, but the value is 12, etc. And there's as many value as these attributes that describe the population. So a population is made of many uh, entities like that with uh, values of uh, variables and values for each uh, attribute. Now, uh, the principles of building a synthetic population is using any kind of information or data you have on, on the distribution of those values uh, to create uh, realistic entities. Uh, and then on, on the right side, you have a uh, few notations. And by XA, I mean the distribution uh, of attributes of the population. Like for example, in, in the bottom there, you have the pyramid of age uh, depending on gender. So there you have the distribution of age and gender uh, and the relationship between them. The other kind of information you can base your generation upon is um, sample of the population. So you have the whole population in the picture and the sample is only a limited set of individual or a limited set of attributes for the whole population. Anyway, we can call, call it P prime. So it's a uh, part of the world population. So there are both information you can inform the process, the generation proce process with. So now there's only two ways to use those uh, sources. And unfortunately, you never have the full distribution of attributes. You, you have always missing parts in this for ethical purpose or practical practical purpose. You cannot know every relation between the attributes and values and so on. And you cannot also access to the whole population because uh, you will be able to identify all the people. And for ethical reason, this is not possible. So as I said, there's two ways to use those data to generate your synthetic population. Uh, so I call this generation process GOSP for generation of synthetic population. And there's two ways. So SR for synthetic reconstruction and CO for uh, uh, combinatorial optimization, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, for the first uh, process called synthetic reconstruction, the idea is that each entity will be represented as a vector of value. And the objective of the generation is to rebuild uh, this vector based on any kind of data. And this is the, the strength of, of synthetic reconstruction. It can use any kind of data. Okay, you have a certain knowledge on the distribution of, uh, of attributes and value. Okay, you can use synthetic reconstruction. You only have a samples. Okay, you can turn it into a distribution of attribute and build your synthetic population. And if you have both, it will be even better. And there's a second way to generate your synthetic population. And this one is to copy uh, an entity you know from a sample. So you copy, basically you copy a P to be a E, an entity, uh, and you repeat it N time if you want a population of N. So those are the two ways, and there's no other way to generate a synthetic uh, population. So basically, synthetic reconstruction is based on Bayesian statistics. So what do you want is having a representation, uh, the best one of the underlying distribution of attributes. Uh, so you want to learn XA, we can call it X prime prime A, and this is the, um, the distribution you learn. Okay, and you can the, the, the most basic way to learn it is 
only to take the data you have. Uh, like for example, there's two data table in, on the left. So they come from INSEE, uh, the French uh, Statistical Institute. So they are in France, in French, sorry, but they cross age, gender and marital status. So you can directly use those distribution to inform the uh, drawing of people. So you can use plenty of other uh, statistical tools to, to learn this distribution. And you can even use uh, deep learning or generative uh, adversarial network, uh, more precisely, to do those kind of job. So once you have the representation of, of the distribution of attributes, you only have to draw people from this distribution or your entity. You draw the entity from this uh, distribution. In combinatorial optimization, you uh, need a sample to draw uh, P with replacement, so to have your whole population, but you also uh, need some constraints to feed the optimization process you, uh, you, you have in it in, in the, during the, the generation. So there you can use any optimization algorithm like uh, eye clamping or, or um, uh, random search, any, anything you want. And basically, you uh, copy uh, the people from the sample to satisfy what you know from the global distribution of attributes. So you want to have uh, this amount of uh, uh, male and this amount of female, this amount of uh, people uh, under 10 years old, and so on and so forth. So this is the basic principles of synthetic population uh, generation. Now. Uh, the question that you can ask is why do we need synthetic population? So there's, there's a few pros and a lot of cons, actually. Uh, so the pros, if you want your uh, agent-based social uh, simulation to be realistic, you need realistic agent, basic. Uh, and you need synthetic population generation if you don't want to reinvent the wheel again and again, meaning reinvent uh, an algorithm to build your population from your data. And there's plenty of things that calls not to use synthetic population because algorithms are too, complica too complicated, uh, hard to experiment with, uh, there is no reusable tools, etc., etc., etc. And anyway, who does that in uh, social simulation? So this is uh, something uh, we've done for uh, the last uh, conference, uh, European Conference on Social uh, Simulation, uh, CSS, in 2019. Uh, we look at uh, four years of publication in the Just Journal. And basically, the results were uh, quite straightforward. In most cases, uh, so agent variable were randomly set. They just use random uh, function like uh, uniform or Gaussian. Uh, for one third of the model, we even don't know what or how they, they compute the variables. Uh, for a few set of them, the variables were, were uh, 42 because it is the answer to everything. Uh, so it was a constant value. And in some cases, they were calibrated on data or even used. And there is only one model of a 33 that use uh, actual uh, algorithm to generate these synthetic populations. And this is pretty much the same about the data they use uh, to inform this process. So in most cases, it was expert, expert knowledge. As I said, it was always uh, 42. Uh, in one third of the cases, it was, we don't know, actually. And in some cases, uh, it were distribution of frequencies uh, or samples of the population uh, coming from surveys or if you have a sample, you build your population from it. Anyway, it brings to uh, the GenStar uh, API and that has been uh, developed in Java. So this is a modular Java API, open source. They, it becomes to be 
huge uh, 27,000 uh, line of code. So it's a bit, bit a mess inside. Anyway, it is open source. You can contribute. You can go to the repository. There's templates used in, in Java. There's some UML descriptions. And there's also a Gamma plugin that has been used uh, in several uh, projects and models, including uh, uh, escapes that, that will be presented uh, tomorrow, I think, but also Como Kids. Uh, again, it will be presented tomorrow. Then uh, Jetstar, basically, it, it, uh, is made of uh, four uh, core library. So there's four libraries. So there's the core library where you can find the higher order uh, abstraction. So what is a population, what is an entity, attributes, value, etc. And the dictionary is made to uh, do the link or the pre-processing step for uh, GenStar to understand your data, your input, input data. Something I will get into after that uh, in, in Gamma. So there's uh, three other library within it. Uh, the first one at the left, uh, Gospel, is for the generation of synthetic population. Uh, there is inside several uh, facilities um, to uh, se several features uh, to deal with uh, data, tabular data and files, but you can also natively download uh, data from INSEE and uh, IPEMS. Uh, there is um, uh, um, uh, ND machine matrix to store uh, the distribution of attributes. And there's also several uh, algorithms uh, from CO or SR uh, techniques, but also make sure they, there's not yet multi-level population, but as we can see, this is the next uh, feature we want to bring. And there's also some validation for your population to assess its quality. There's also a second part, which uh, will not be the focus of this presentation, which is the localization of, of your population, where you put your agent, and uh, I will not go into the detail for this one. And there's also another part, uh, which is uh, akin to uh, building a network uh, from, from this population, but it, it has been quite, uh, uh, it remains uh, really humble, this one. Anyway, so we built a Gamma plugin for this uh, API uh, created in, in Java. And basically uh, it provides you uh, ways to input your data, to understand your data, and then to create uh, a population. So here is a snippet of the code. So I, I, I will go uh, into it. I have five minutes to open Gamma and make it run, so it will be okay, I think. Uh, so I will get back to this example within Gamma. And there's also the localization process. And here you can see the example. Uh, so, so we apply the, the algorithm in the city of Rouen in France. And you can see the result there. Unfortunately, uh, there's a uh, uh, bug. Uh, uh, um, the current version of the JustDown plugin is not compatible with the 1.8.1 version of Gamma. And the bug fix is on the progression. Anyway. I will just uh, talk about the latest thing I will be uh, I have been doing in it, which is uh, uh, multi-layer synthetic population, meaning um, uh, a population of two layers. Uh, for this case, it will be household. So we build a, a population of household. We build a population of individual, and we uh, couple them. So basically, this is the same problem but you have two types of entity there. So two type of uh, attributes and several types of values. So on the top left, you have the households and for each line you have one household and bottom left is individual. So basically the idea is to uh, couple those two information using GenStar. So we will build a population of individual and then we will mix using a Bayesian network, will mix the information to build household using a combinatorial optimization in that case. And this will be the uh, trickiest part. Uh, so the trickiest part will be to leave uh, the presentation. Okay, so this is done. And then to switch uh, to uh, Gamma, 
And I am quite surprised I am the first one to do so. Uh, so let me share. Uh, let me share uh, my gamma. So I, it's a gamma I downloaded uh, yesterday, actually. I, I tested it uh, before. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if you see the menu, actually. Can you, can, are no, you not, able to? Not the menu, just uh, what is okay. done. But... Okay. Anyway, you, you can download, you, you can use the GenStar plugin directly within Gamma, uh, going into the help menu, install new plugin, and you, you have, uh, I, I'm not able to show you the, the, um, the URL, but you have a, a URL to put and uh, Gamma uh, GenStar will be loaded into Gamma directly. And you have uh, within your plugin model, you will have to refresh the, the folder. You will have a GenStar folder where you can find several examples. The one uh, I was uh, showing to you uh, just a few minutes ago. And we can see them there. So the big part of uh, what GenStar is doing is understanding your data. So here is the way uh, GenStar input your data. So you have some kind of census file uh, where you have a number for each attribute. There it will be uh, age. So we specify the variable for age. This, the first one is less than five years old. Second one is between five and nine, etc. And you have also gender here uh, for be a male or a female. And then you can uh, generate your population based on the census file you input. And uh, hopefully it will work. It's okay, it works. So it's a really simple example. As you can see, the, the agents are not uh, uh, localized, but you can see that you have a certain distribution of, of gender and distribution of age. And there's several other examples in it. Uh, with increasing complexity, so there you have several ways to uh, to input the age uh, in terms of ranges. Here you have also the uh, working status of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can you can try them and you can uh, play with them. Uh, and just just a lot of things to say that we use GenStar within ComoKit for a specific application, as I said, uh, like creating. Okay, so. Here is the, the sorry, the Kevin. I think we have to, we'll have to go to the conclusion. Okay, okay. Uh, well, this is the conclusion. Uh, I would just want to say that the, the, the plugin is accessible, uh, and, and you can have feedback. You can ask me if you want to, to have new features, and we will be adding soon uh, the feature that allow you to build household with individual insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all to all of you. Sorry. Uh, so, any question in the chat or in the or you can raise your hand too. Uh, I saw that there is uh, some discussion that started in the um, uh, in the Slack, in particular that start on the Zoom but continue on the Slack. Some of them are quite uh, technical, so. But for, for everybody, for any user with a programming skill, developing a, a, a new plugin in Gamma is not so complex in the sense that you need to have skill in, in Java uh, only, basically. And there is documentation to, to guide you in order to create your plugin and to uh, uh, deploy it. Uh, do I miss any question in the uh, Zoom? Okay, so all of the plugins that have been presented here are available in the, as Kevin said, you can add them to the, to the Gamma. It was also the case as Jean-Francois mentioned it uh, from the one he developed. Um, okay. So perhaps uh, first question on my side, I have many of them in fact. Um, yes, for you, Kevin, as you are, on, you are in big on my screen, 
uh, first one would be, do, did you compare uh, the, the GenStar library with other uh, generator? Does it, have, um, does it have an interest to compare to other generator? And could you provide some, I don't know, metrics on the powerful of GenStar? Uh, actually, I do not compare GenStar with other generator because uh, there are very few of them that make the the same thing, and, and there's actually only one called Spew, uh, which have been written in R uh, language, and which is not uh, anymore supported. Uh, but it is the only one to uh, generate your population, localize the population, and they build what they call the synthetic environment uh, overall. Anyway. Uh, it will be nice to compare uh, GenStar uh, to other algorithm, but because most of the generator algorithm, in fact, code in R for most of them. Uh, and yeah, it will be really useful. And for the quality assessment of those uh, algorithms, there's, there's plenty of things. There's really simple one, like the number of misclassified individual in your synthetic population. So it's only a matter of counting the number of cells uh, you are doing wrong. And there's more complicated things like the uh, Z star uh, indicators and there's plenty of things that mix uh, statistical and, uh, about your population. Okay. Uh, so perhaps something to add, the gen star uh, is provided as a plugin of gamma. It can also be used in, uh, as an independent library. Do you have some plan to integrate it uh, deeply in Gamma, not deeply in the sense of when people download Gamma, they have GenStar with it? For the next version, for example, do you plan to integrate it, to provide it directly with Gamma? Yeah, if, if, yeah it would <laughs> be great, but uh, I think I, I will not integrate GenStar as it is. I mean, the Java API, I will rebuild most of the things so it will be simpler because it's related to the question I, I dropped on the Slack about the usability of uh, Gamma extensions. And I think complexity uh, of use, but also uh, of reading is really something uh, that, that prevent people to use them. So I will go for a simpler uh, integration. Only few parts, only few algorithm, only few things. Okay. So complexity will sorry will make me move to BDI architecture, and uh, so we we had a great uh, roundtable about uh, that. Finally, had a great discussion about comparing mathematical model, agent-based model. So the extension with what uh, has been presented is uh, BDI. Why and when in particular do you have some uh, criteria? Is it sometimes necessary? It is always, it is, yes, even sometimes necessary in which cases. So it's for you, Mathieu, and after that uh, for Louise also. Good, good question. And I, uh, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would, I would say, um, uh, well, well I, I'm coming from the mathematics, uh, and now I'm in agents, and uh, I think what I say to my students is um, never forget one or the other. If you use one, still have one or the other in your mind. Um, and if you go to the agent's uh, world, do it the simplest way and complexify it when you need it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when do we need to complexify? Complexify. complexify. This is the question. Uh, I think it's uh, the question to $1 million. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, don't, I don't have a precise uh, answer. Uh, what I say is, okay, when we are uh, modeling the, the human behavior uh, and the, 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 the decision making process, and this process is complicated, that is to say, uh, it uses multiple, um, multiple 
parameters in input, I would use the, the BDI. I, I would start to use the BDI. If okay. someone has a better answer, uh, I could take it. Yeah, perhaps. But I think we already discussed that point, but I'm not sure BDI is appropriate for decision making, in fact. It's more reasoning, deduction, inference, but it's not really a decision making. Yeah. Is it easy for? Could it be easy to integrate a decision maker, a real decision making algorithm inside Ben? Uh, this is something that can be done in future works. Um, uh, the idea uh, right now, th there are the blue box, uh, the blue the blue processes that are automatically computed. Um, I, I, I would want, uh, maybe in the future, uh, someone else maybe will, will do it, to to make the, the boxes uh, either blue for people who don't want to, to take care of this and say, okay, let's have a, a default solution, but either reddish, uh, for uh, most advanced uh, programmer who could say, okay, uh, I will do my own uh, engine, but the engine is integrated in the architecture. Um, it's in the same, uh, the same thing that Luis presented. That, that is to say, Luis said, okay, I don't want to use the, the ocean uh, model. I want to use another model for personality. And I'm like, yeah, uh, do it. I, I didn't have time to do it for all the processes and in particular for the decision making processes but, but that i think that could be uh well right now it is done so uh, it can it, ben is built so it can be done like this i think you can plug your own decision making system okay uh, just just one thing i think it's quite simple to hack the ben decision making uh, part if you're just one plan you can have done in uh, in this plan, you can really find what you want in terms of decision making. But it's possible to hack the, the, the Ben architecture in terms of decision making. Yeah, but it's not really clean. It works, yeah, you're right. Luis? Well, perhaps you could also, uh, if, with the same question, uh, but also could you, uh, in answering, could you explain in which case study do you use your M MTBI personality uh, architecture? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, MBTI, it's a different instrument. So, um, for example, if we don't consider uh, a multi-agent context, um, Imagine if we are in a company and uh, the company needs to understand the human behavior, the, their employees' behavior, uh, they will have some instrument to, to do that. And MBTI, the ocean model are, are, one, are some of them, you know, and depend, uh, it's hard to, to answer these questions because depend on the situation, depend on, of, for example, um, which aspects do you want to, to understand from your situation, uh, depend on the, the context, you know. Uh, the MBTI, it's better, for example, um, they use the, the concepts of dichotomies. So uh, we don't have like a, a, a metric as we have in the ocean model from zero to one. It's a little bit abstract to, to, to get some scores. And uh, the, basically the message is these instruments and have the same, uh, uh, they can be used for the same, but they have different approach. So depending on the situation, it would be better to use an MBTI or ocean model. In my case, for, for, for the work that I, I, I'm doing, and we prefer to use MBTI because we have some other papers that, that has some uh, 
works and regarding NBTI that it's very useful for our, our situation. So because of this, we decided to use NBTI. A naive question, would MBTI could be expressed in terms of the ocean dimension? So kind of reduction or? Mm -hmm. There are some, some papers about that. Uh, there, there are some aspects, very uh, there are some correlations between this, uh, these both instruments, but uh, they are not equivalent, you know? So uh, not for all the dichotomies, we can um, have a dimension in, in ocean model uh, very similar, but for some of them, uh, we, can, we can have some correlations. There are some papers about that. Okay, okay. Uh, Patrick asked a question about why using MBTA resonance than ocean. Do yeah, it, it's the same answer yeah. because uh, depending on the situation, you would need to, to uh, it would be uh, better to use NBTI, but you, you should analyze this, all the context uh, about what you would like to measure, uh, the context of uh, the behavior style that you would like to, to uh, analyze, you know, so depends on the situation. Okay, so it seems that uh, the question has uh rise a lot of uh, answer, so great. Uh, other answer in, in the chat. Uh, perhaps uh, I, I had one question uh, for, for Patrick. You presented uh, in particular uh, argumentation by the network less, but argumentation, uh, do you plan to integrate it with uh, BDI to have a, a huge uh, integrated uh, uh, description of human behavior mm. cognition. No, I think it's not necessary. Uh, from my point of view, uh, so it's, in terms of primarism, it's very different, and uh, you can use it uh, just a skill. So you can have uh, an agent with a BDI architecture and uh, use uh, in, in addition the skills argumentation of argumentation. After the voter can do what he wants with it, but I don't think it's necessary to try to. Uh, Integrate them in the same formalism as uh, the BDI. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't. For the moment, I don't see the point. For the moment, we are more. We are working more about. Uh, uh, I, I don't see a specific utility of that. Uh, but it's true that there are some components of plan architecture that we want to can well in which we are interested to use in your model of opinion dynamics and innovation. Uh, Diffusion uh, about the personality, about uh, uh, the re social relations, uh, and things like that. And maybe we will use some part of that. Uh, but for the BDI part, for the moment, uh, maybe, but uh, not sure because we are more working on the opinion and more than the action of the, of the agents. Okay. And so perhaps. If I, if I don't miss any question, I don't think so. Uh, a general question to all of you uh, about data. So perhaps the simplest one would be for Kevin. Uh, is it easy to get data to feed synthetic population generation? And is it the case for in any country, any from the city to the continent or to, uh, to the country? And can you do you have access to such a data for any case study? Uh, in fact, there's there's two type of answers. Uh, there's uh, answers for country uh, countries at the north, and the answer for countries at the south, <laughs> because I have been uh, in contact with both for the generation of synthetic population. And uh, when it comes to north, uh, you have quite easily uh, good quality data. You can use uh, like samples, aggregated data, uh, whatever you want pretty much. But when it comes to uh, data, I, I went by in Vietnam or Morocco or, thing, or countries like that, even Lebanon. Uh, it's getting messy uh, quite quickly and you need some kind of adapter to read your data and to process them. So you need a 
pre-processing step, which can be quite annoying because it, it, it will be uh, data specific each time you have to code something, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so same question for you, Mathieu, for perhaps more about uh, BDI, believe is there any data you can add to feed the model? Um, for, the, for the moment, I, I haven't found any. Um, the only data I have is on the, the situation, the use case, the statistical data. Um, Luis uh, spoke about the, the ocean uh, model and said, okay, it's, it's difficult to, to put a value between zero and one for, uh, for each uh, threat. And uh, I agree. Um, for the moment, I, I don't have any, any data uh, that says, okay, the population is about this way or this way. What I did in my model um, is I, I just build a, a Gaussian distribution. Say, so, okay, people are usually normal mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and let's use it. Um, but that's, that's clearly one of the, one of the biggest problem when you're dealing with psychological, uh, dimensions, social dimensions, you, you do not have uh, statistical values uh, to, to put in, in the machine, I would say. And MBTI, you have access to some data, some survey or? Uh, in my case, uh, uh, we are trying to, to develop it, not only the uh, we, we, we are trying to develop the NBTI model within Gamma. So for example, uh, we are working with the NBTI theory to try to represent uh, when an agent would be, uh, would have uh, an extroverted uh, personality, for example, or not. So we are trying to, uh, to create some aspects that we could, uh, we could estimate that, oh, this is a, a, a it agent has a preference for extroversion, you know? So it's a way to try to like to create the, the data and try to capture some behaviors and, and make some inferences through this, this behavior. Uh, so it's, it, it's something that we are trying to do in our work. Is trying to 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 like to to build the data, you know. Okay, thank you. And I saw Patrick uh, share some data about ocean for ocean. Fascinating. Um, do and on your side on the argumentation, you have. Um, or you do some survey, but for example, about uh, alimentation? Uh, it's very linked to the specific uh, domain, application domain. So uh, for instance, I, I saw the argumentation framework plugins was used for to study the diffusion of, of a vegetarian diet. And for that, we, we yeah, we, we, uh, we carry out some survey to have uh, some, and some interview, we study, so we analyze uh, some documents to build the arguments and the link between the, the arguments. But that is, it was done uh, yeah, by hand uh, and uh, there no, we have no automatic tools to, to build the arguments and their link. Okay, so thank you very much um, for the presentation. Thank you for the great uh, extension to Gamma. Uh, we move directly to the next session. Uh, Arno Gringa will be the chairman. Arno. Yeah, thank you, Benoit. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. So yeah, we will, uh, we will have the, the last and the third session about transport and mobility. So we had two great sessions this morning uh, speaking about this topic. Uh, we will have so four more uh, speakers. Uh, we will deal with a charging station, air quality sensor, bicycle, pedestrian, and swarms guidance. Um, I was checking in the list. I'm not sure that the first speaker, Chitan Patak, are you here? Uh, I didn't see you in the list. We will see. If not, we have some speakers that are here, so we might uh, shift. So we can maybe wait a little bit. 
Um, Chitan Patak, are you here? I'm not sure. Um, and the next one in the list is Nathan uh, Coin Coins. Well, I don't know how to pronounce the name, sorry. And I don't see him either in the list. So actually the session might be quicker. So what I propose, uh, I see that uh, Dana uh, Kazieva, you are in the list. If it's okay for you uh, to present, uh, that will maybe help to wait for the two other speakers to come. Um, are you are you here, Dana? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thanks. Is it okay for you to present first? Sure. Okay, great. So you will speak about simulating uh, bicycle traffic flows in a geospatial agent-based model. And uh, you have 10 minutes to, to speak. And I think we see your slide, so that's great. And you can just switch to, okay, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, welcome. Thanks. Uh, so good evening, uh, everyone. Um, as you can see on this uh, beautiful picture, Traffic can be diverse, built infrastructure limited, and behavior of individuals different. And we have built uh, the model that simulates some of these individuals, precisely uh, bicyclists. It is a well-known fact that um, nowadays urban environments are suffering from problems with space, pollution, congestion, and so on, uh, caused by transportation sector. And as a response to these issues, decision makers and urban planners aim at the promotion of more sustainable mobility, such as cycling. Strategies uh, may include um, building new infrastructure, providing bicycle sharing systems, digital nudging interventions, and so on. All these measures, to be effective, they require the support of mobility data. And uh, however, data is still problematic to acquire. There are issues with the undercoverage bias, incompleteness of data, low spatial and temporal extents, despite advancing sensor technology. Uh, thus, we propose an agent-based model that would simulate traffic patterns with a high precision and over regional extent. Since modeling becomes advantageous uh, when experiments or data acquisitions um, are difficult to carry out in the real setting. Um, in general, um, bicycle model builds a representation of the world, a transportation system where every individual person is heterogeneous by age, gender, and employment status, has a desire to travel and carry out activities. We took the base uh, bicycle model published by Valentin and Loidel and extended it. Here are the few model specifications. It simulates um, traffic flows in Salzburg, Austria with its adjacent municipalities to include commuters. Its population is around um, 186,000 persons. Uh, temporal extent is one day with a one minute time step. There are a bunch of input data sets, uh, as you can see on the slide. Um, they define a uh, built uh, environment, uh, heterogeneous uh, residents, and individual decision making. Uh, at the end, the model produces a heat map with bicycle traffic volumes and number of cyclists at counting stations. I don't know if you can hear the storm. We, the weather is angry today. Um, it's so okay, it's okay. I'm sorry for that. I cannot do it. No, anything. no, that's fine. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so here is a simplified workflow of processes. Uh, after a world is initialized, residents are characterized based on some assumptions. Uh, every individual iteratively selects and travels to an activity, and we have uh, implemented an extended mode choice to include trips into activity schedule by modes other than bicycle. However, only cyclists eventually move along the network while others teleport to a destination only to save um, uh, computational uh, um, time. Uh, then uh, during the movement, 
agent is registered at every traversed network and counting station. Um, the heart of the model is in decision-making processes or choices that agents make during activity selection. First, an individual selects activity type, then starting and duration time, um, mode, speed, reasonable travel distances, uh, destination, and route. And these choices are context dependent on individual characteristics and between each other. Um, on the right, you may see most of the assumptions that govern decision making. Those are probabilities and average values from surveys, reports, and studies. Um, I don't go into the detail here, but would like to mention that the routing uh, choice follows an assumption that cyclists prefer to move along the safest uh, or bikeable routes, which uh, we achieve by weighting the network with bikeability index. Uh, regarding the technical implementation, we used a uh, gamma platform. And due to the large uh, study area and extensive number of facilities, roads and residents, the model needs um, minimum four gigabyte of RAM on a Windows computer. It took um, like, on average, it takes um, a little bit less than an hour to run one simulation of one day. Uh, we opted for this platform because it can deal with large scale simulations and embedded graphical interface that we used extensively um, during the modeling process to verify that the model is built correctly. Um, it was very important to have a good spatial representation of environment, routing and spatial operations, such as proximity uh, to compute spatial reasoning of persons. Uh, the platform also could um, read and write spatial data for us, which we gladly exploited. Um, so uh, since we have some validation data at our disposal, we could validate model results by looking at spatial and temporal distributions of cyclists at different scales. Uh, we also use the methods of pattern-oriented modeling to validate model complexity and check model results uh, against patterns of relative frequencies. <clears throat> Observed data um, included counting data at nine stations spread over the city. Uh, they register cyclists and aggregate counts by 15 minutes time step. We also have derived um, um, data from uh, GPS tracks uh, from the bike citizens and Strava mobile apps. Now let's jump into the results. On the left side is the spatial distribution of cyclists over a day, while on the right side, uh, side you can see hourly counts of cyclists at stations, simulated and observed. Um, in order to prove the complexity of implemented concepts in a reference model, our, uh, the presented model, we ran for alternative scenarios where each concept at a time was simplified or eliminated. Um, at the table um, on the left top corner, there is a list of concepts, their alternatives, validation criteria, and comparison methods. To uh, generalize the results of these comparisons, uh, alternative scenarios produced either bigger errors or uh, in counts at stations or in significant weak correlations. Uh, for example, the most appropriate uh, evaluation criteria to check a uh, starting time concept is the temporal distribution. And as, as you can see on the table um, in the top right, uh, the random scenario for starting time choice has very weak correlation in comparison to the significant uh, strong coefficients for the reference model. And we can also make conclusions about the shortest path uh, against safest path in the table below it, where shortest path has weaker correlations with observed uh, GPS tracks than safest path in the reference model. Uh, this is maybe more visual for understanding. The first map A shows bicycle pattern um, concentrated um, along most bikeable routes and um, 
corridors uh, such as Salsa River crossing the city from north to south. Um, and there are also arteries going between densely populated areas with uh, large uh, employers, facilities, residential homes. Um, the map E, uh, on the other hand, looks different because the routing was not the safest part, but shortest. And as we concluded, it less correlates with the observed GPS data. Uh, finally, relative frequencies also matched well with the observed data. We compared cyclists' uh, counts during morning against afternoon peaks at stations, as well as the counts at central stations against uh, stations in the outskirts of the city. And lastly, similar ratios of cyclists at stations were observed um, and simulated between the west side and uh, east side of the river. So now I would like to conclude with the statement that the model fulfills its purpose to simulate disaggregated traffic flows with high spatial and temporal resolution during an entire day at a regional scale. Uh, the spatial temporal traffic patterns emerge from the individual behavior of residents and the model can be used to run different uh, strategic scenarios to predict changes in mobility patterns and uh, support transport planning decisions. Um, among the limitations, we have concluded that quality of input and validation data massively influence model results and validation results. For example, GPS data from the fitness-oriented app um, does not include all spectra of population, thus any conclusion should be taken cautiously. Uh, so far, we used that... Uh, data that are available and accessible to us. Thus, it is the best possible output we can get with existing data. And uh, talking about the outlook based on the study, um, I'm now extending the model to include context-dependent decision-making based not only on the individual characteristics, but also environmental variables. Um, to uh, describe different types of cyclists that would have different uh, specific attitudes and preferences. And secondly, uh, we also are extending the model with pedestrian mobility. Finally, in case you're interested yeah, in this model. Have, yeah, you will have to conclude. If it's the yeah, next slide. It is published yeah. here in Comses. Um, check it out. Also, the results of the research are published in the journal. International Journal of Geoinformation. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this very impressive uh, presentation. Very clear, we might have some questions later. Uh, actually, don't hesitate to ask some question in the chat or in the Slack. And uh, the good news is that uh, Chitan Patak uh, arrived, if I am not wrong. Uh, Chitan, can you confirm that you are here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Thank you. Great. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about the show. So you can start um, your talk uh, about Chargeval, a multi-user framework for simulating and analyzing charging station deployment scenarios uh, using ABM. So you have 20 minutes uh, starting from now. Uh, you can share your screen and we can see together if it's working well. Um, are you able to see my screen now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming in today. And thanks a lot, uh, the Gamma team, for organizing uh, such an interesting and uh, an international event uh, in times like these. So um, uh, without taking much time, I'll begin. Um, I'll be talking about this platform we developed called Charge Eval. Uh, for evaluating the uh, electric vehicle charging station uh, network uh, changes. Uh, so uh, let me start with some context. So th the work was given to us by the Washington State Department of Transportation. They're the state uh, transportation agency and they look after the uh, infrastructure uh, around the state. And so they wanted to, uh, to ask us uh, how they can go about installing new electric vehicle charging stations. And when I say charging stations, I'm es essentially for the rest of this talk talking about fast charging stations. And because they're so costly and used infrequently um, that it's important uh, to install them in locations where there will be high demand. 
so we wanted to make sure that we somehow capture all of that using a tool and we decided uh, that agent based modeling would be a good approach for that. And so I'll be talking about uh, how we went about uh, doing that. So in developing charge eval, our goal was to be compatible with real world processing for processes for prioritizing projects. So Washdot already has processes in place by which it decides what could, what consists a good location. And uh, we wanted to make sure we augment that, we support their existing process rather than just come up with something new on our own. We wanted to report on a lot of uh, performance indicators like EVMT, that's electric vehicle miles traveled, uh, the overall charging and power and energy consumed at any given time, the expected waiting time at charging stations, for example, uh, things like that. We wanted to see if uh, we wanted to allow evaluating multiple deployment scenarios. So rather than uh, just trusting the result from one scenario, we wanted to make sure if the users can compare, for example, if they deployed something uh, versus something else. And we wanted to explicitly capture travelers' decisions about vehicle choice and charging. So I'll be talking more about uh, what that means, uh, but essentially this is the goal. So th there are a couple of other tools that are out there that try to be prescriptive, whether they, uh, whether they say, okay, this is a good location, for placing a charging stations. We, however, took a different approach where we are evaluative. So we essentially just try to see that given a charging station deployment scenario, what happens uh, if you do that? So the different components of charge eval um, are these. So we have a long distance travel demand model. Uh, the, I go, the goal of long distance travel demand model is to predict the number of trips between any given OD pair in the state of Washington on any given day. So we have around uh, 700 uh, zip codes uh, in the state of Washington and the model predicts the number of trips happening between each OD pair. So that's over 300,000 uh, OD pairs that we have the uh, number of trips for. And these are just passenger vehicles. So these are all cars, uh, not necessarily EVs. Then we use the vehicle choice decision model uh, to predict uh, the probability of using an EV for the given trip, right? So we know that a trip is happening between an OD pair. Now, what is the probability that an electric vehicle is chosen for this trip? Because the travelers might have access to more than just the electric vehicle they have. They might they have access to a rental vehicle or, or their own um, non-electric vehicle. So what is the probability that they actually use an EV for the given trip uh, is being uh, given by the vehicle choice decision model. And then now that we have all the trips, we then simulate these trips uh, using the agent-based model, we call it the AV-ABM. Uh, and within AV-ABM, uh, then we have a charging choice decision model that predicts the probability of charging when an EV reaches a charging station. So uh, then within the agent-based model, we want to simulate how all the charging stations are being used. So we had several of these models previously in the lab. We had the long distance travel demand model, the vehicle choice decision model, and the charging choice decision model. We created the agent-based modeling framework uh, using all these tools, using all these models um, to predict the uh, charging station usage. So the simulation in charge eval goes through two processes. It's essentially trip generation followed by agent-based simulation. Uh, I won't be talking too much about uh, trip generation uh, today, but uh, the general idea is we had the long distance travel demand model. We use the trip characteristics then to determine uh, whether it makes sense to use an EV for the trip. Uh, we then end up with uh, lots of trips that are happening on any given day in the state of Washington. And then these are being simulated uh, in the agent-based simulation framework. So what is agent-based modeling? Uh, I'm sure this slide is the most uh, redundant for this talk, uh, but in case there's somebody new, uh, the idea of agent-based modeling is to model emergent behavior given some set of rules. So as modelers, we have the independence of setting what these rules are uh, and agents, our agents have to abide by them. And when they do what happens to our system, that's sort of what the emergent behavior of our system is. And that's what we are interested in studying. So what happens if our agents follow these certain rules? And it is uh, therefore on us to determine how um, in detail do we specify these rules. So the more detail uh, or exact we want our simulation to be, uh, we can do that, but uh, that there uh, are some um, consequences of that. So uh, we, we can determine how much detail we want our agents to follow. Uh, 
Agents typically exist in an environment and uh, they follow time. So, so they, they go over time. We used gamma uh, for our agent-based simulation. Uh, we like gamma because it had a very high level and intuitive uh, agent-based language, but it also supported GIS and data-driven modeling. So in every ABM, the agents uh, are the electric vehicles. Uh, we got this data from the Washington Department of Licensing. They gave us uh, which zip code, uh, what was the make and model model year of the vehicle, and we used that information to find out the uh, fuel from fueleconomy.gov, the uh, average uh, energy consumption and the uh, SOC, uh, things like that. Uh, we got the Washington Road Network from the Washington State Department of Transportation. These are the roads on which our agent will move. EVSEs or charging stations, we got this data from uh, the Alternate Fuels uh, Data Center. Uh, this has information about the location of the charging stations, the number of plugs, the type of plugs, and so on. Our environment is bounded by the state of Washington. So at this point, we do not consider the trips that are happening between states. We're just considering trips that start and end in the state of Washington. And it is 2D at this point, so we're not uh, simulating the effect of uh, road gradients. We simulate a total of 24 hours uh, and at one minute time step. So we know these uh, state of our agents uh, every minute throughout the day. Just a quick overview of our system. Um, here we see all our agents, the EVs, the roads, and the charging stations, they derive from uh, the world agents. This shows the object-oriented nature of gamma and how uh, we can uh, sort of derive our agents from um, other agents, essentially. So we, uh, this is the only uh, inheritance we have. Uh, our agents sort of derive from the world agent, and then they have, uh, for example, EVs, they have uh, various states. So the EVs can either uh, be in resting or driving. They could be driving to a charger, charging, or so on. Then they have uh, these attributes uh, that we populate. So for example, it has a vehicle ID, the vehicle make, um, and so on. And uh, it has these actions. So it can, at any given moment in time, uh, be performing some of these actions. And similarly, for other agents, we have uh, attributes and we could have states uh, and actions as well, but only the EVs sort of needed uh, those things here. So just a quick overview of our electric vehicles. We are around 50,000 uh, today, I think around uh, more than 50,000 plug-in electric vehicles. So these are the ones that can fast charge. There are more uh, overall electric vehicles. Uh, we have this information about make, model, model year, location, um, and so on. Uh, the skills, for example, one of the skills is driving. That's an inbuilt gamma skill that we use. Uh, and what that does is, uh, as the vehicle moves, it consumes energy. And so that is sort of what we are modeling, how the energy of an electric vehicle is used as it's moving on its trip. And then when the energy is low, it will decide to charge. They charge at charging stations. Uh, we have a, over 150 charging stations in the state of Washington uh, that are relevant for these vehicles. So we are only studying the Chademo and Combo charging stations, not the Tesla charging stations. And so this is important because uh, the plug type is a constraint. Uh, if you're familiar with electric vehicles, not all electric vehicles can charge everywhere. There is a compatibility issue there, and we have to make sure that the right plug type is found at the charging station where a vehicle wants to charge. So our model uses finite state machine control. Uh, in Gamma, this is uh, a control strategy uh, that's very intuitive. So for example, at any given moment in time, an agent can be in one state uh, and one state only. And there are rules for transition from one state to another. So uh, our, our agents, as we see, these are uh, marked in gray. These are the states that an agent can belong to. So either it could be resting or driving. Uh, it could either be driving to a charger or be queued at a charging station, be waiting or, or charging. And then there are rules about how the agent then transitions from one state to another. So at the start, uh, any vehicle is resting. It then keeps resting until 
uh, the time in the simulation is greater than t rest. It then drives, um, and then uh, it could either be stranded if the SOC is less than zero, or if it reaches the destination, it is finished, or uh, if a charging station is nearby, uh, and if it makes sense for it to charge, it would then decide to charge. Uh, if it reaches a charging station, and if there are EVs already uh, waiting, then this would uh, this vehicle would be added to the waiting queue. Otherwise, it would then charge if it's its turn and then continue driving and so on. So this is sort of the uh, sim simulation framework we have. And um, this translates intuitively to how we think about driving. And so this control scheme made sense for us. Uh, here, if this video plays, I'll just try to show what the agent-based simulation looks like in practice. So uh, we see here on the top right, uh, let me change my... Okay. So we see here in the top left uh, that the vehicle we have is in a resting state. We, I'm just showing here a typical, only a single path uh, in our simulation. So right now we have excluded uh, we're just looking at one EV at a time. And so this in green shows the path that the vehicle will take. Uh, it starts from here, it ends uh, somewhere on the right side there. In red, we see uh, all the charging stations in the state of Washington. Blue are the charging stations that are near uh, our path because a vehicle would not want to uh, relocate a lot from its path to charge. Um, and then, um, we'll see how that vehicle actually looks like. So it's in resting state right now. Soon it'll uh, start driving. We see that uh, uh, a green square sort of shows uh, the vehicle driving along its path here. And then uh, if it's near a charging station, it might decide to charge and we'll see that the SOC is now increasing. So this sort of uh, graphical user interface that Gamma has is really helpful. And this allowed us to sort of debug the simulation and reach to the point where we were able to then run it in a headless state. So uh, the way that Gamma runs in practice right now in every, every ABM is without the GUI, uh, but uh, this sort of shows uh, how one trip typically looks like uh, in Ghana. So let's quickly discuss uh, what the system architecture is like. Uh, so we have an application host. Uh, let's look at this big uh, rectangle here where uh, we can access our first graphical user interface called EVDES or EV Infrastructure Designer. And this is uh, sort of just a map of Washington where you can place new charging station by clicking on the map where you want, and then you click Submit. This then writes that uh, request to the database, uh, which then triggers, uh, uh, which then fires a trigger, uh, which is picked up by the simulation manager. So the simulation manager is continuously watching for these triggers in the database. As soon as it sees one, it then queues that uh, request for simulation. Uh, when it's time for the simulation uh, to run, it then spins up a new EC2 instance that performs the trip generation, uh, which upon completion fires another trigger, uh, which then creates another EC2 instance that performs the agent-based simulation. So all our agent-based simulations and our trip generations are happening in their dedicated uh, EC2 instances. These are virtual machines uh, running on AWS, but you can sort of have this run uh, anywhere. As the individual process is finished, they write the results to database, which can then be viewed uh, in a results viewer. And all of this can be monitored uh, using a Grafana instance uh, uh, where we can see uh, the progress of our trip generation process or the agent-based simulation. So I won't go into the demo today, but uh, just quick views of, of what these look like. Uh, so we have the EVDES, EV Infrastructure Designer. So here we have uh, most of the real estate is taken up by this map of the state of Washington. Uh, here we see several overlays on the map, but I think the key here uh, are these markers in white, which show the location of existing charging stations. And then you can place new charging stations by clicking uh, wherever on the map, right? So these are the roads and you can just, uh, th these purple ones are the newly added charging stations we see. Uh, each one sort of add uh, a new row to the right here in the new site list, uh, section. Uh, you can then go and configure each and every charging station. So you can click the green button uh, that we can see here. Uh, and again, I'm pointing to 
my screen. Uh, when we click the green button here uh, next to the site ID, uh, a new uh, window pops up uh, that allows us to configure each and every charging station. So we can then select the type of plug we want, uh, whether we want a chatim or a combo only. Uh, we can set the number of plugs, the power, uh, the price of parking and charging uh, sort of each uh, for each and every charging station individually. We could have however uh, ever, uh, many we want here. And then we can submit uh, the simulation. When we do this submission, it gets written to the database. Uh, a new instance is started that performs the trip generation uh, and uh, followed by agent-based simulation. Again, there's no GUI associated with these processes because they are both headless in their dedicated uh, EC2 instances. Once it's finished, uh, we then can view the results in the results viewer. So typically, it currently takes me around three hours for the agent-based simulation, uh, around five to 10 minutes for the trip generation process. Uh, uh, we do not want the user to wait, so they are informed with an email. Once the results are ready, they can then go to the results viewer and uh, get the results by selecting the correct uh, simulation run date time. So this is the sort of the primary key uh, or, or the lookup value that you can use to find the results. So here we see uh, a quick simulation summary. A total of 1274 uh, vehicles were simulated out of a total of 42,000. So this is um, a few few days old. Uh, right now, this number is over 50,000, as I said. Uh, but uh, then out of these 50,000, what this result is showing is 1,274 were chosen uh, as part of the agent-based simulation, right? So the trip generation process uh, followed, uh, which used the vehicle choice decision model determined that 1,274 electric vehicles uh, are traveling on this given day. Uh, we have, this is the built infrastructure, 20 new EVSEs were added uh, as part of this simulation. This is the plug count. This is giving us how many trips actually finished. Uh, this is giving us how many trips didn't make it to their destination or were stranded. This is the total electric vehicle miles traveled. These are the number of charging sessions that happened, number of EVs waiting. And this is the overall uh, EVS utilization by sort of adding the energy, uh, sorry, the power here for all the plugs uh, in the state of Washington. We can similarly dive deep uh, into the individual agent states. There's a BEV tab here uh, we see on the left that gives us information about the EVs, each and individual EV throughout the day, similarly for uh, each and individual charging station uh, throughout the day. Then we have the Grafana dashboard that lets us sort of monitor this. So we could have several of these processes running. So here I see, uh, I have six agent-based simulations running, 11 trip generation processes are ongoing. And then within the agent-based simulation, when we select a particular uh, agent-based simulation, we see uh, what the timestamp is of the simulation, what is, how many agents are in which state. So this is a this simulation and a lot of vehicles we see around uh, 9,000 9, vehicles are being simulated. You, you have uh, one more uh, one more minute, uh, Chitan. Got it, just on my last slide. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Uh, so we have charge eval that does uh, EV trip generation based on data and behavioral models for vehicle choice. Uh, we th then are able to do provide minute by minute simulation data for EVs and charging stations uh, based on some of the rules that we have decided the EVACs and charging stations follow. We, did, we find out that AV ABM scales uh, with the number of EVs and not with the number of EVSEs. So charging stations counts doesn't significantly affect it. The, if you increase the number of EVs, these are the agents with a lot of activity happening, uh, with a lot of decisions that they make, a lot of state changes, uh, the time of uh, agent-based model changes. Uh, the, Framework technically is infinitely scalable, so you can run several simulations in parallel. Um, you're just limited by your cloud bill because the more simulations you run, sort of uh, more uh, EC2 agents uh, instances are spun up. The framework is open source, hopefully well documented, and results are in database, so we can use it for further uh, analysis, integration, and programmatic launches. Uh, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chitan. Very uh, impressive work uh, summarized in 20 minutes. Uh, we might have some more detailed questions after. Don't be shy to ask uh, any question on the Zoom. I have some if there is no question. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Uh, now we will have uh, Nathan. Uh, Nathan, if you are here, 
Are you, yeah, you are here, so you yep. will present uh, your project about a participatory network of air quality sensor uh, on bicycles. So you have uh, you have 10 minutes uh, also to present. Yes. You, can you hear me and uh, see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So uh, hello, uh, I, I am Nathan. Um, I'm currently doing uh, an internship at uh, IRIT. And uh, I'm going to present to you, to you uh, so an agent-based model for a participatory network of air quality sensors on bicycle. So uh, first, uh, the context. Uh, we know that uh, monitoring the, uh, the quality of uh, European density is a very important issue to help uh, stakeholders to take uh, appropriate measures. Uh, so uh, like a reduction of uh, road traffic, for example. And uh, we know that uh, uh, bo both spa spatial and temporal di distribution of uh, urban air pollution are very heterogeneous. And uh, then uh, it is uh, very important to develop a reliable, fast, and spa uh, spatially spread uh, measurement method. Um, and for now, uh, we know that uh, measuring, uh, measuring air quality everywhere in, in a city is a real issue. Uh, because uh, we know we, we know we have a uh, uh, air monitoring station, but uh, they are not uh, spatially spread in the city. So the objective here is uh, to use bicycle traffic to collect information on a large space spatial scale, unlike convention conventional air quality stations. So uh, as I said, uh, which are located in at a few specific points. So uh, in this work, uh, uh, we propose to study the usage of a resident daily bicycle traffic as a participatory network of air quality sensors. So in, we, in a real life, uh, we would equip a volunteer, volunteer cyclists with an air quality sensor to use uh, during their daily commutes. And uh, as we do not have any data about uh, cyclist trips, uh, we choose to build uh, a, an ABM uh, on Gamma uh, that models a group of bicycle mounted sensors mapping urban air, air quality. So trace, then uh, traces of urban air quality collected by the uh, uh, bicycle sensors uh, uh, will be then used to infer air quality at uh, the city level. So that's why first we need uh, to, to build a synthetic population to represent uh, the, this group of bicycle mounted sensors. And uh, we can then det uh, determine the daily commutes and uh, thus, uh, how well we could uh, uh, transcript urban air quality thanks to uh, uh, the bicycle measurements. So first, uh, some details about uh, the synthetic population of cyclists. Uh, 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 it's a fact that uh, all, all social categories behave differently. So for example, we know that the workers generally go, go to work uh, at uh, the, th the same time uh, mostly so be, uh, 8 a.m., for example. Where, whereas students' work uh, schedules are uh, more spread out over the day. So students can go to school uh, between uh, uh, 8 a.m. and uh, 10, 10 a.m., for example. So we need to know how well uh, these different categories of population would perform in uh, the, the participatory network. And uh, so that's why we, we chose to simulate uh, the populations of workers students, uh, so la leisure trips and delivery trips like uh, uh, Uber Eats deliveries, men, for example. And uh, so in, uh, in this simulation, these populations have uh, uh, various behaviors uh, because uh, each population is characterized by first a, a spatial distribu distribution, which are uh, so, uh, the, the living place and destination place of each agent, and a te uh, temporal distribution so when, when do the agents of uh, the population leave home and come back home? Um, so uh, these characteristics are known for, uh, from household tra tra travel survey, uh, like in INSEE, and uh, some visual visualization tools uh, like a mobiliscope. So uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, I show you um, uh, the, the visualization of a uh, student population at home, so on the left uh, left part of the screen. And uh, 
uh, the student population at uh, so at uh, their workplace, so left uh, right side of the screen. So you can see that the destination places of uh, this population in particular, so students, uh, are very uh, are concentrated in a few point points, which are finally uh, the, the main schools and the universities in the city. So uh, these destinations uh, are not uh, as uh, concentrated for workers, for, for example. So now that we have uh, uh, our synthetic population, so students, workers, etc., uh, we have to generate their daily trips. So it's it's uh, uh, all uh, most of the work is done as uh, we know their uh, living place and the destination place. Now we want to get the, the population location at any time of the day, in order to to understand how well their measure, measurements can trans can transcript uh, urban air quality. So uh, by using gamma's go, uh, go to function uh, between. So first, the living place and destination place of uh, each, each agent. We generated trips, uh, which are so sort of the, the shortest path on uh, the weighted graph corresponding to roads of uh, Marseille. And uh, then we checked uh, the re relevance of uh, these trips by comparing uh, so sort of these uh, shortest path to trips uh, which were generated by cycle wood planner like VB bike. And uh, we then as assume that uh, these uh, trips match with uh, the no normal path agents would usually take uh, uh, every day. So uh, uh, basically, we compared uh, the generated trips with the real life uh, with the real uh, real life trips uh, by uh, by uh, by cyclists would take. And so, uh, thanks to uh, the, the mobility model we built, uh, we, we we know where and when all agents are, and uh, we can co couple this uh, this mobility model with a pollution model uh, for the city of Marseille. So we can know uh, finally uh, when and where uh, when and where all uh, measures measures are made, and thus we get uh, what we call synthetic observations which we can analyze to map the urban pollution. So uh, once we get this uh, uh, synthetic observation, um, we can use the, them to predict the pollution in the un unmeasured areas. Because uh, so in the city, we will have uh, areas which are very, very well me measured by cyclists, so hot areas, and some uh, areas where we don't know the pollution, but we would, li we would like to. So, uh, we are going to do predictions to know to to estimate the, the pollution in these uh, unmeasured areas. So, uh, uh, what are these predictions? Uh, these are uh, regressions of uh, first synth synthetic observations with some environment environmental indicator, like uh, for example ve vegetation, the distance to the main road, and uh, then each each prediction. So, uh, using different env environmental indicator. Uh, will be uh, pertinent or not, but uh, to evaluate uh, this, uh, this uh, pertinence, we uh, we compare the prediction to what is uh, the real pollution in uh, in the predicted areas. So this is how we uh, estimate uh, uh, the pollution uh, uh, in the all, all the city, starting from a what bicycle uh, measure. And the uh, so finally, uh, evaluating these, uh, the pertinence of uh, these predictions can answer to the question, is bicycle traffic enough for mapping urban air quality? And uh, to conclude, uh, uh, well, the, the model we built is uh, basically the synthetic population, uh, uh, which constitutes the bicycle uh, population of the city, and uh, the simulation of their daily trips so that we know when and where agents uh, measure pollution at any time. And uh, then we obtain uh, synthetic observation that we can use to, to try to map urban air quality. And uh, to, to, to conclude, uh, uh, I will pre present you a, a very short term upgrade uh, I'm going to try to do. So uh, actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, currently I'm simulating uh, 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 the shorter, shortest path uh, taken by cyclists, 
but I'd like to simulate uh, a participatory, participatory path, which are uh, in, in them we suggest to cyclists uh, that they slightly modify their route to, to go in the low measurement areas. So instead of going right to work, we would uh, instead uh, we would like to suggest cyclists to take a, a path where we don't we, we don't really know the the the, the pollution. So that's it. Uh, nice, impressive, right on time. Um, very, very nice talk. So yeah, looking forward to see the, the next iteration for the, the cleanest pass instead of the shortest one. Uh, so very nice talk. Thank you. Um, we will have now, um, so we will have uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus, it's a long time. We didn't see, we used to cross each other with Patrick actually in the, I think the last time was in the city science meet in Hamburg. So you will uh, present us some work uh, about your current work. Let me go back to my slide, um, where you will speak about simulating pedestrian flow in a new neighborhood uh, applied to the grass Pro district uh, in Hamburg. Um, so Jesus, if you are, here, let me know. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Am I sharing the presentation, right? Yeah. Is it? That's okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Perfect. So you have uh, you have ten minutes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, Arnaud, for the presentation. Uh, I am Jesus Lopez Baeza, coming from the Digital City Science Department at Hafen City University in Hamburg, and I will talk today about this project in which we are simulating pedestrian flow in a neighborhood that is not built yet. So it's in the design phase. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. So I must say that this project was financed by, by Hafen City GmbH, so the developer, the development company that is building the neighborhood and a subsidiary, the Grass Group, that is the company of the neighborhood that they are building. The neighborhood is called also the Grass Group. And during the first year, we had a cooperation, as Arnaud just pointed out, with the uh, MIT Media Lab, and now in the second year, we just started a cooperation with the Austrian Institute of Technology for a couple simulation models that I will show you later. So uh, basically what we are doing when we are simulating urban environment and we are, we are studying cities in general and we are talking about cities, um, we are approaching them from this perspective that they are not only form and function and they are not only buildings and streets, but they are also many other things that are not necessarily tangible. So we need to think about cities as these kind of complex systems that are, are constantly evolving. So they are urban form, they are also urban vitality, but they are also perception and values. And this is what we consider for when we are modeling our district. And sorry, this. Yeah, so uh, basically, yeah, in this particular case, we are uh, modeling the district of the Grassbrook. And what we wanted to do is to design this district not from the perspective of uh, making some money building new buildings or making space for offices, but from the very center of, uh, from the perspective of the individuals. So the individuals and pedestrians are really in the center through these two different approaches. The first of them is self-expansion connected to the process of uh, urban identity so that people can be space owners and they feel attached to the places that they are living in. So they feel that they come from this place. And at the same time, through the process of self-awareness constructed by uh, everyday activity, this is also considering space users. So people commuting there, going there to have drinks, to have lunch and etc. And in the balance between these two is where we found uh, this project that is focusing on pedestrian environment. So basically, this project is trying to address the question how to plan a new district being the focus of uh, being the focus social interaction activities on urban life in general. So this is the area that we are modeling the district of the Grassbrook. It looks like an island It's limited by several canals and a river at the north. And it was a competition a couple of years ago and now they are starting to develop it. So what we did was to simulate that in Gamma, how the building, how the buildings and how the street would affect people. So basically we are considering people as a, sorry, pedestrian flow as people doing things in a location through the everyday, so through their everyday activities, which from a more technical 
way of phrasing it is people with their routines and needs and decisions can be modeled on gamma, uh, making doing activities in uh, hosted by places that are the amenities like shops, restaurants, offices that have a specific function, capacity and availability that can be also coded, coded in gamma. And everything happens in formal space with their buildings, with their streets and with their parks that we can use also in gamma connected to GIS or BIM databases. So when you scale that up to thousands of people doing millions of things, then at the end you have flow that can be parameterized and can be studied. So basically our model, our simulation model is using formal space as an input, the location of amenities that the user can decide, and then the definition of people with their own routines so that at the end we can output flow and we can measure flow and then compare different scenarios of distribution of amenities or modifications in the formal space and see how that affects the flow, the pedestrian flow. So our model that we simulate, that we built on Gamma is actually four models running simultaneously. One of them is focusing on the process of someone going from home to work. Then we have a model that models the lunch break, if they go out to have lunch outside or if they go to a, a coffee after lunch. And then model three models everything that happens after work until they get back home again. And then we have model four that is modeling not the everyday, but the exceptional. And that comes because the designers were treating the spatial use locations uh, differently. So we needed to model them differently. This is, for example, museums or hospitals that you don't visit on a daily basis, but they are also uh, part, yeah, not of the everyday, but of this exceptional. So all of these four models ran simultaneously uh, in the CityScope environment, which was started by the MIT. Again, we have several simulation models that are connected to each other, and pedestrian flow modeling is a simulation model is one of them. From a user perspective, you have several access points, as for example, a web interface that you can access from the phone or from the computer, but we also have a physical 3D that's stable where you can build uh, move buildings around and see what happens in the simulation when you place a building in a certain place. So the project of the GRASS group had two steps. The first of them was the, called the Grazio and was a, a, a simple tool for fast response design iterations that was intended to be used by the designers when they had a blank, uh, a blank table, a blank piece of design, and they were starting to place the buildings on the streets and then get real-time feedback about how that was working. Now in the second step, when the design is more or less matured and they have their own built mod BIM models with uh, more detail, and now they are starting to place the functions. That stage is called the functional planning. They have some questions that the models can answer and or can address and help them make decisions about where to place these functions and how to modify the street network a little bit. So our model gives them feedback about that. So we are working with several indicators of this pedestrian flow. And we are also working with several indicators that compute the location of the amenities. And on top of that, we have these uh, other simulation modules, uh, such as, for example, sun exposure, wind flow simulation, solar radiation, or uh, stormwater management, which all together comes to inform the designers and the users of the tool about the areas of high and low values from the perspective of the intangible values attached to the pedestrian flow, such as what streets are more likely to become hotspots of social life. And then also from the side of the physical space and the comfort that is attached to that. So areas of exceptionally high and low performance in terms of wind protection or sun protection or sun exposure. So you can match two, these two things and see how much people is going to affect, be affected by, the, by which condition, conditions and where. So, uh, yeah, our point was to inform the decisions um, taken by the designers by the use of this tool. For example, one of the questions that they had was whether to place a bridge from the north of the neighborhood of the Grassbrook to the south of the neighborhood of Hafen City that is right next to it. And our models, with all of the um, possibilities that we simulated, uh, pointed out that we reduce the length of the trips, obviously, if we have the bridge because it's a faster connection, but then this uh, affects directly the model choice threshold in which people are deciding whether to walk or take a car. So if you have a bridge there, then people are more likely to walk. If you don't have a bridge there, trips are longer, so people are more likely to take the car, which has an impact in the overall traffic flow and carbon emissions. So uh, it's a way of informing people about the decisions that they are taking, uh, the possible consequences that they are uh, probably having. Then when we are um, visualizing in the different inputs that the user have with the different conditions that characterize the pedestrian flow. 
For example, we have here uh, the decision from the side of the designers whether to have the amenities clustered in one location, all of the restaurants in one location, all of the offices, or to have a mixed distribution. And here, for example, we see that there's um, a 59% correlation in the temporal entropy. When you have the amenities mixed, you have areas active 24 hours. If you have an area only with restaurants, then people are going to be there only when the restaurants are open, which is quite obvious, but now we can prove it and these models gives, gave us also the chance to theorize about the principles of pedestrian flow and how the different conditions that characterize the distribution of amenities affect the different conditions that characterize pedestrian flow. As for example, we can see that having different amenity types or having a higher density of amenities or places to uh, socialize and to do leisure affects also the pedestrian density and how much it affects the average duration of trips, several length of trips, or interaction opportunities. So the chances of people to have physical encounters in the same space at the same time. So um, last minute, I will talk about the accuracy of our models. So I, I, I didn't talk about the technicality of the data, but I can talk about the accuracy uh, very quickly. So uh, what we did to test if the assumptions that we were making and the data that we were using was accurate or not was to model with the same conditions the neighboring net neighborhood, that is the neighborhood of uh, Hafen City. What happened there in 2019 was that they placed some automatic pedestrian counters in some sidewalks and they measured the real uh, pedestrian flow by pedestrians in the streets. So we compared our agents walking in that district with the results measured by the cameras counting pedestrians and we found out that the simulation uh, the simulation and the real data were quite similar with a very similar distribution with a maximum deviation of around six percent that we were able to cut by half when we added the weight of uh, in the places we weighted them by the attractivity which uh, that we extracted from social me media so at the end we came up with yeah, you will have to you will have to conclude uh, so yeah. So yeah, basically the, this model helped, helped us theorize about amenities defining flow and flow creating social life. So that basically the designers by the use of these tools can uh, make decisions so that cities are more inclusive and better for everyone. That was all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Rizos. Very nice uh, work. Um, we will have the last, uh, the last talk actually um by Zai Mata. Um Zai, are you here? Yeah, I can see you. Yes, uh, I am here. Okay, great. Uh, and then we will have some QA uh, at the end. So you can keep on asking some questions. We will uh, we will summarize them. So uh Zai Mata, you will have 10 minutes to uh present us your probabilistic probabilistic swarms guidance uh within the gamma platform. Okay, can you see my screen? It's all right. Uh, yes, perfect. Okay. okay, okay, thanks. So, welcome to this presentation. This is Zahi Mata from ENAC, University of Toulouse, and I will be presenting probabilistic swarm guidance using Gamma platform. This work has been done with three colleagues during an academic project under the supervision of Professor Garosh. First, let us put the problem in context. So, recently, Swarm concepts are being considered in many applications like surveillance, coverage, or exploring an area. In all of these applications, the main goal of the swarm is to distribute itself over an operational space to achieve mission objectives specified by an operator. In this slide, we illustrate a simple example where we have a swarm of 1,000 autonomous mobile agents which we would like to guide into the target shape, which is a two rifle. Next, we will see how to guide a swarm. The control of a large scale swarm is a very challenging problem. Many research work have been conducted to tackle this problem. For instance, Akimi Seol introduced probabilistic swarm guidance using Markov chain. The main novel feature is that the introduced method is is probabilistic and is based on Markov chain. Moreover, the swarm is guided in a decentralized manner. Thus, the swarm asymptotically achieves the desired distribution, distribution sorry, without any communication between agents. Being decentralized, such method would be, could be very interesting to implement on real agents like 
drones or unmanned aerial vehicle. However, it needs to be tested, simulate, and simulated. Given that Gamma platform allow to, to build explicitly agent-based simulation, and as it can support a large scale, a large number of agents, we decided to interface pluralistic swarm guidance using Gamma platform. The presentation is mainly divided into three parts. So in order to understand the, um, the algorithm behind probabilistic swarm guidance, we, we will quickly introduce Markov chain. Then we will cover the needed computation in order to implement probabilistic swarm guidance. And then we will see how we implemented probabilistic swarm guidance within Gamma platform. To understand Markov chain, we are going to start with, with this problem, which almost have a physical origin. Suppose we have a particle that jumps between two states, A and B. I will just state it. It can, if it starts at A, it, it can stay at A with probability 0 0.6 or jump to B with probability 0 0.4. So we can, we can represent this state diagram using a compact representation, a matrix, a matrix, so called Markov matrix. Here we have two states, A and B. So we will have the following uh, matrix with, uh, with the probabilities. And it is a two by two matrix. So because we have two states. We would like to know the evolution of the probability distribution over a long period of time. So specific, specifically, the problem we are interested in is we have a particle. We know it is at position A. What is what? we know it is at position A uh, or at position B. What is the probability to find it at position B after one step, n step, and infinite number of steps? It turns out that we can represent the probability distribution using P vector. P vector have simply the, the have, simp have simply the following uh, explanation. For example, here P0 uh, told us that uh, at time zero, we have, we are sure that uh, the particle is in state A, and we can compute the all the probability using the following mul multiplication matrix. So M by P zero to find where what is the probability distribution after one step, and then after n step, and the, finally the equilibrium state. The equilibrium state told, told tell us that there is one third. Uh, chance to find the particle in A and two third chance to find the particle in B after a long period of time. So now we will see how probabilistic swarm guidance are based on Markov uh, chain. So uh, the idea is to build the Markov matrix M such that its equilibrium states correspond to the desired formation state space uh, for the des desired formation shape. So first, the, the physical space, uh, so, sorry, sorry. So we, the algorithm is mainly divided into three parts. So uh, first we will partition the space, the desired this, uh, target shape, we will partition the space into bins, and then we will introduce motion constraints for building the Markov, the Markov matrix. So first, the space uh, over which the swarm is distributed is partitioned into M into M bins, corresponding to where the agents uh, can be located, and the element. Uh, and then we compute the the target distribution V, uh, which have the following explanation: V i is um, is the prob is the desired probability of finding an agent in in bin i. Next, we introduce motion uh, constraints with adjacency matrix A. In fact, an agent cannot jump from one state to any another state. For this, we introduce a new parameter, uh, distance D. And if the distance between two states, I and G, is, is uh, greater than D, then I, the, um, the corresponding element, is set to, to zero to tell that this uh, agent cannot jump from I to G and otherwise to one. Given 
given V and A, so the desired probability distribution and the adjacency matrix, we build the Markov matrix uh, M. So notice that M have the same shape, have the same shape as, um, as the adjacency matrix. It is an M, M by M matrix and M, remember M is the number of bins. So the number of bins is the number of, um, and we, we use to partition the desired tar target shape. So once we have computed the Markov matrix, the Markov matrix M, an agent will locate itself in the um, in this uh, in this uh, in this matrix, and um, for example, an agent in bin E uh, will will have the following probability M I G. So M E G will be the probability to move from bin E to bin G, and all the all the agents will roll the dice in order to uh, will ro will roll the dice in order to see where they will be located the next step. And given that we constructed the Markov matrix in A way that the equilibrium state corresponds to the target shape, this will guide the whole swarm into the desired formation shape. So now we will see how we implemented probabilistic swarm guidance in gamma platform. So in order to implement uh, probabilistic swarm guidance in gamma platform, we uh, we first developed a, a gamma plugin for image processing and Markov matrix computation, um, which do all which do all the computation in order to uh, to compute the Markov matrix M and the adjacency matrix and the desired distribution, and a gamma L model. So, to in order to have the interface and to interact in real time with the simulation. So a user can select a target shape, select the number of uh, agents to, to simulate and uh, choose some and tune some parameters. He can also, for example, change the target shape during the simulation. Uh, Zahi, you have uh, one more minute. Okay, so here is, here is some results of the, of the simulation. For example, in the beginning, we launched 1000 agents and the target shape was the two rifle, and then we changed the target shape to ENAC, and uh, all the computation are done using gamma. So to conclude, uh, gamma is very intuitive to express agent-based mod model, and it allows to visualize and interact with swarm guidance algorithm. Future work will focus on how to add motion characteristic for agents and implement conflict avoidance techniques. And also, we would like to continue three-dimensional simulations, which we already started. And we just we would be very grateful if we can have uh, some feedback on how what is the best way to represent sparse matrix in gamma, as uh, the Markov matrix M has a lot of zero inside, and it can optimize the running the running time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zahi. Um, I'm sure there is someone that knows how to answer to this question. What is the best way to represent a sparse matrix in gamma? And we will give some time to someone to answer to this question. Uh, thank you very much, the five of you, for all your talk. That, that again, we always say that after each session, we are very impressive. Um, I think the day was pretty long, so we will take some questions. Uh, and we will try to stay on time. So we have something like 10 minutes for some question. I will, uh, what I will do is that I will uh, re-ask some of the question that was uh, more or less answered already in the chat, but for people that didn't have the chance to look at it. Uh, there was a question from, uh, from Sri Rama to Shitan about the charging station. Um, the question was about, I think, the availability of data, and uh, he was asking uh, why do you need to use IBM, uh, and do you have some data about EVs? Uh, Chitan, if you are still here, maybe you can tell us a bit about the, the difficulty to, to gather some data, and that was also one of the questions I wanted to ask, like what is the mix between data that are publicly available and the one that you cannot have as a academic partner, I guess. 
Chitan, if you are still here. I see you are still here, but maybe. Um, okay, so I can answer for you. Uh, I think the answer. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no. Uh, okay, the answer was that you didn't have the data from EVs, uh, which I guess is something hard to get from uh, from private company, and that was one of the reasons why you need some uh, some simulation. Um, there is some question for uh, Jesus. Uh, that you also already uh, answered, but you can tell us a bit more. The first question was about how do you compute the, the comfort uh, in your uh, in your uh, in your approach? Which uh, was yeah. yeah, it was the project about uh, Grassbrook uh, and pedestrian flow. So yeah, how do you calculate the comfort? Uh, yeah, in this case, the comfort we are getting from an external simulation, we are connected to the uh, Austrian Institute of Technology, the department, the city intelligence lab, and they have this open source software that you can connect to and get the results back. So basically, we are using their engine to get the results of the comfort of our simulation. Okay, and it's like, it's a number, like how do you characterize it? Like in gamma, for example, mm -hmm. how do you yeah, respect well, that? Uh, uh, yeah, no. At the moment, at the moment, what we have in the tool is that there, there's all the simulations modules are kept independent, and then we merge the results at the end. So that that, that means that the user from their user dashboard can filter an area that has a high sun exposure comfort and also a high density of pedestrians. So the area is uh, pointed. And then there's also some automatic detection, like for example, an area with a too low comfort level of wind and too many people going there and this kind of thing. So what we, what we are doing is to merge the results at the end, but the simulations are not connected. Okay. Uh, there was another question for you about the, the pedestrian movement, uh, if it was network based or if it can be uh, in a full 2D space on places. Like not constrained on the on the road, I guess. Uh, yeah, here we are doing it network based, and that was an input for uh, from Patrick a couple of years ago when we were modeling the the, the other project about ports. And yeah, when when we have the network base, it's just much faster and better to control. Okay. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. There, there was another question uh, about the AIT, the machine learning model. So that, that was for yeah, another. That was comfort, yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, I don't know if there is some. Uh, okay, there is some answer for the sparse matrix. <laughs> so there is no, no sparse matrix yet, uh, but we, we, we might add this feature. And a question for Zahi, your work could be useful for simulating a backcasting, having an end state and exploring method to reach it uh, could be useful for land use change, for example. Do you have some idea about that? So for backcasting, I'm not sure to understand the question actually, but Zahi, I'm sure you are. Um, I, um... Uh, I'm reading I the guess, question one moment. <laughs> I, I guess it's uh, is your approach uh, can be useful for simulation backcasting. To be honest, mm -hmm. I don't know what is backcasting. I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, yeah, it's the same. I am not really an expert. So but the contrary of forecasting. Okay. So you know, ah, okay. you know, you know your life, your last uh, state. Okay. Actually, you're, you're trying to find out what kind of initial configuration is needed to reach it. So okay. you explore the initial configurations that can lead to a, an end state. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if there is a link between, um, because our work is mainly based on Markov chain. So with probabilities. So maybe there is a link. I am not sure. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I'm checking quickly on the Slack if there is some question connecting to that. Um, I don't know if Dana, if you are still here. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Uh, no, I had. I mean, I had some question about the. I really like also your visualization. I was wondering if all of them was made uh, with Gamma 
or if you use some uh, other rendering tools? Um, I used um, an open source QGIS um, software to visualize um, spatial distributions. Okay. And also for graphs, I used R. Okay. Um, okay, okay. I think, I don't know if there are some other question like uh, if someone want to raise his hand or ask a question. Um, if not, I think we can maybe stay on, on the timing, uh, finishing this uh, very, very interesting uh, day, but also very demanding, I guess, like what, 12 hours of, maybe not 12, like 10 hours of, uh, of presentation. Um, maybe Alexi, you want to, to say something to finish this uh, day number two? And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with pleasure. And it will be it will be fast because it's uh, almost uh, 11 p.m. here. Yeah. So I'm hungry, uh, but actually, I, again, it's a little bit like uh, yesterday. I find I found really fascinating to see the to see the diversity and quality of the works uh, exposed here, and how well as a designer of a, of a platform. I'm, I'm really impressed at how people use it. Uh, and and you, for some of you, you have found ways I could have never imagined uh, ways to, to, to display some things, ways to explore uh, models in, in such and such ways. So it's really impressive to, to see the, the creativity you're, you're deploying here. And, and actually, I. I sincerely hope that we can continue the different discussions and maybe focus them, some of them, not all, but some of them a little bit more on the, the next iteration of Gamma and how we can, we can really uh, support you and support this creativity uh, by removing maybe some uh, uh, issues you already have by providing new tools, providing new things. So it's really a dialogue we need to have. And I was talking with, um, uh, Patrick and others um, uh, in the chat uh, at some point. I think that, for example, for next year, if we, if we do something next year, and I hope, given given the very well, the incredible interest of this uh, session, uh, then it would be it would be interesting to have some kind of hands-on sessions. Uh, so building a uh, building a plugin, okay, um, using a plugin. So having everyone, uh, even if you don't really work on this but um, really doing some hands-on sessions. So not, not really training sessions, complete ones, but at least uh, one hour, two hours working together and exploring together some of the things in the platform. So it's ju just an idea. And I, I just want to thank um, very warmly all the presenters. Uh, it's been an incredible day. Uh, yeah, almost 10 hours, uh, probably a little bit more. <laughs> and. Um, Tomorrow we still have another day of presentations, uh, so please stay tuned. Okay, don't don't leave the workshop uh, today, and uh, stay to stay so that we can have some discussion together. Especially at the end, there is some kind of conclusion discussion uh, planned, um, and part of it will probably be devoted to what are we going to do next. Okay, since uh, the big success of this first uh, event. Okay, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the moderators, to the presenters today, and see you tomorrow, all of you. Um, At 8, uh, 8.35. Uh, I, I, yes, I was, <laughs> I was trying is the, to... It's the French time uh, for risk management. So tomorrow, there, I guess there will be three main uh, topics about risk management. A lot of talk about participatory modeling and a session about uh, COVID, because maybe we didn't speak enough about COVID at the end of the of the session. Uh, okay, thank you, Alexi, and uh, okay, thanks yeah, thank you, thank you everyone. You tomorrow. See you tomorrow, yeah. Bye.